Welcome to DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Hey folks, and thank you for joining us on another edition of DAX Machina. Join me in the style in the studio house tonight is Robbie Rip Reigns, my brother from South Krakalaki, and Stephen Wildman Monrotus, who's here on he's we've got vacation Steve this time. So you know he's a he's a little more laid back, a, a, a little a uh, little slightly tipsy and 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 full of piss and vinegar. And uh, we're we're uh, un unfortunately we're down one doc tonight who uh, is in uh, another state teaching a class, but hopefully we'll have Doc back with us soon. Boys, how the hell are you guys tonight? Don't I, I am rolling to quote our friend Doc. <laughs> there we go. A uh, slight change of plans, folks. Just want to let you guys know, Ed Testerman, who was going to be with us tonight, so we could talk about the ghost investigation, had some family stuff come up at the last minute. Uh, so we will reschedule the show where we talk about the ghost investigation, show pictures and things like that. We'll reschedule that when he's clear, uh, probably next week sometime, uh, or whenever his schedule permits. Uh, so tonight we're just going to kind of throw caution to the wind and ad lib and talk about, you know, recent sightings. And Robbie was at the Georgia Bigfoot conference yesterday and up and up until earlier today and had some interesting things happen down there. And, you know, and like I said, Steve's a uh, Steve's vacation, Steve. So who knows what kind of stories we might get out of Steve. And uh, we'll just, uh, we'll just kind of take it from there. And, oh, also uh, for those of you who are members of the Patreon community, a brand new story just dropped. It's called The Monster of Pennebates Creek. Uh, it's about seven, seven or 8,000 words. It's a pretty good size short story. It literally went up earlier today, like early in the morning hours. So if you are a member of the Patreon community and you haven't checked it in a while, uh, again, there's a brand new story up there. Uh, it will be part of the coming uh, coming short story compilation that should be out later this month. But if you're a member of the Patreon, you'll get to read that story right now for free. Is that the one I like so good? I mean, you talked about the the bridge. That oh no, no, that's that one's on there as well. But that one's been up for a little bit. Uh, that one, that one's um, that one's. I I the the, that's like rat called Wrath of the Dog Man. That's right. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, we talked about that one. That one's been up on the on the Patreon for a while. There's actually a bunch one. of stories up on the Patreon. Yeah, this obviously it's not the first time it's ever happened, but uh, uh, Northwoods uh, was saying what I was thinking. Uh oh, kind of hard to get derailed. Uh, I guess it means the show can't exactly get derailed tonight. Good point. That's where you don't really have any rails to start from. Um, the train's going also, Noah's Noah's out with his buddies tonight. So the moderators, I forgot to let them know. So heads up, mods. Noah's not Noah's not there tonight. Um, Miss oh, Lamaze in the way. house. We're working without a net. <laughs> uh, so <Yeah>. Robbie, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the Georgia conference, and uh, then when you're when you tell us when you're done telling us about the conference, you can tell us about uh, your uh, interesting adventures. So this is uh, on me for the next little bit, then, huh? <laughs> well, for a minute yeah. or two. I'm good, Miss Lene. Uh, so yeah, I went down last night, met up with Jessica, uh, the Cryptid Hunters. We went to the Georgia Bigfoot Conference. Uh, went to the meet and greet last night. Met a bunch of good people. Um, it's as far as conferences go, it's not the smallest conference that there is, but it, I mean, it's nowhere near one of the biggest ones that I've been to, but it's a good little conference. So, you know, they have it in uh, Clayton, Georgia or Dillard, Georgia, because they have it at the uh, Dillard house. So if any of you want that are around that area, want a, a decent one to go to, you know, vendor wise, it was probably 30, 40 vendors there. And that's some nice, nice stuff. Um, had some good speakers uh ron moorhead was there ryan paul trembley friend of the show he he spoke uh was he there by, by video or was he actually there yeah, I think he did video again like I, he he hadn't spoken when i or spoke when i left but last year he spoke and he spoke by video. So, and i didn't see him so i'm assuming he was not there because i'm assuming if he'd been there 
we would have laid eyes on each other at some point and and said our haze. He may he may show up in the chat tonight, but I didn't see him. So if he was there, we missed each other. Uh, obviously, Jessica was there. Her uh, one of her teammates, Matt Delph, who is known as the badass monster hunter. He, Matt's a pretty cool cool guy. Um, uh, who else? There's a few other speakers that I didn't recognize, but you know, it, it was a it was a good conference overall. I had a had a good time. So I know you're dying to get into the, what happened last night, though. Just kind of told Phil Steve in before we got on the show. Yeah, when uh, I get a text late at night from Robbie, you know, like, "Hey, are you free for a video call?" I'm like, "Ooh, ooh, ooh, ooh something happened." Yeah, I, and and Dave will tell you this. Steve will tell you this. I'm not the kind that spooks real easy. I mean, when DA took me out to Joe Ball, Noah was having to kind of reel me back in because I was all over the place. And, and folks, I know a lot of people say that they're the kind of person that doesn't spook very easy. And I'm generally one of those guys that has got ice water in his veins. But when we were at Joe Ball, I was more nervous than Robbie. Robbie was like, I want to go. He was ready to just take off and chase everything. And same way when we got down to Blunt Road, I was just like – the only thing that gave me pause at Blunk Road was those people because they were an unknown factor. Was those people down there on the boats? It's the only reason I didn't go run off all over the place over there too. But anyway, say that I, I don't get spooked easy, especially out in the woods. I late at night, none of that stuff bothers me. I just that's just the way I've always been. So, uh, Jessica and I decided we we're going to go back out in the woods again this year, just like we did last year. After the meet and greet, went back to the hotel, changed into. A, camo and got our packs and everything on and off up the mountain we went me her and her son ben go back to this exact same spot and for anybody asking the comments no i'm not telling you where it's at it's her some places that she, her and her team do research so i'm not it was in the state of georgia that's all i'm gonna say so up up in the woods we go and uh we go back to the exact same spot that we had our encounter the year before. Some of you may remember the story I told where we were out and it was like we were at a concert. It was so loud with insects and then all of a sudden it just turned off. Well, this time it was the exact opposite. We drive up there, drive to the spot. We step out of the car and it was dead quiet. There was not a cricket, a tree frog, nothing. The only sound we heard, any kind of ambient sound was an airplane flying overhead. So I immediately look, looked at Jessica and I said, this is weird. And she was like, yeah, I, she said, I've never been here and not heard some kind of ambient sounds other than when they stopped when we were up here that time. So I'm already a little bit, you know, higher alert, like, okay, that's weird, but not, you know, not a game changer type weird yet at that point. So we start walking back up the hill. There was a little bit of fog around. So we get pretty close to where we were last year when we had our encounter. And I started looking off into the, into the wooded area above us or out in front of us and up, up above us a little ways. And you can kind of see the fog rolling. So I'm seeing movement, but, you know, I'm like, okay, am I seeing fog just rolling in between the trees and it's just, you know, causing shadows and you see the movement and all that kind of stuff. So I started just watching for about, what I say, 10, 15 minutes DA, I think. Something like what that. I told you. Just to let my eyes get used to the dark and to see what was there, see what was moving. And, you know, when you, it's just like hunting. You don't just go in and automatically start pulling your gun out and start scanning. You got to sit there for a while. You got to watch things. You got to listen. You got to be quiet and just let things settle back down. Because when, when you drive up in a vehicle, it disrupts the, the flow of the of everything. So we're looking around, and I'm, I'm seeing movement, but I don't know what that movement is. So finally, Jessica asked me, so what are you looking at? And I said, I think I see movement up in front of us somewhere, but I don't know if it's the fog that I'm just seeing drifting in, in between the trees. So she started, I didn't tell her exactly which direction I was looking. So she started looking while well, you know, about five minutes later, she started seeing movement. Then Ben, her son started seeing movement. Well, as I'm kind of looking, we're all three looking in different directions. 
<laughs> so yes, it could have been, still could have been the, the fog. I understand that. Well, about ten minutes later, Jessica's like, "Well, you want to go on up on top of the hill?" And her son was like, "Yeah, let's go." And then something I don't know, call it, call it cop's intuition. I call it that lizard brain that you've heard us talk. I don't know what it was, but something was like, "No, stay right here." And I told Jessica, I said, "No, nah, stop. We need to stay right here." Because, like I said, I, I I wasn't sure if it was my eyes playing tricks on me or if there was something up there moving around. But I know that it appeared that there was something up there on top of that hill moving around. So we stood there probably another maybe 10 minutes watching. And it just started, I started getting this feeling like, this is this is not good. We Not that I felt like fear or overwhelming. Oh, I got to get, I just, I, I felt like things were kind of closing in. And it's like I told DA, I said, if, felt just it, what I had the best I can describe it is right then right there in that situation it felt as creepy to me as it did when we were in Joe Bald that's that's all I could, it was like being in a vacuum it was like nothing was around us was happening or, or in a broader spectrum around us it was only like right there in that area and Jessica even started picking up on something she was picking up on a lot of how she, I can't remember what word she used but uh tension maybe was the word she used, but she was picking up on something. And Jessica's really, really good at, at picking up on stuff like that. Um, so I said, it might be time to go back down, down to the vehicle. She goes, yeah, I think you're right. And at some point in that, I can't remember if it was before I said that or after I said that, I think I heard a big rock hit the ground somewhere. Hit, you know, you know how to, if you've heard something, big and heavy like a rock hit the ground you know what that sound sounds like now i not swearing that's what it was but that's what it sounded like so we start walking back down the hill and i started backing up you know watching them over my shoulder and i said okay we're good and i turned around to walk in the same direction that uh jessica and ben were and as soon as i the, i cannot describe how instantaneous this feeling was as soon as I turned around and was facing down the hill with Jessica and Ben, every hair on the back of my neck just, it was like a, like I grabbed an electric wire. I mean, it was just, I immediately had to turn around. And I, I spun back around. And when I turned around, I saw I was ex, uh, describing it to Stephen D.A., I saw three or four, it looked like shadows just doing like this, <laughs> like crossing over each other, but it were coming in our direction. So as soon as I turned back around and saw that, it was like a split second later, they all just stopped. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, go straight to the car. Don't stop. Get in the car. And I heard Jessica say, got it. And they were down going down the hill. So from then on, I, I started backing down the hill and I take a look over my shoulder, back a few more steps, take a look over my shoulder until I got to a point where I felt like I could turn around and go. And got to that point, turned around, got in the car, and we left. Like I said, I don't get spooked. I don't. But when I got back and me and DA started talking about it, he said, dude, it, it sounds like you were being hunted. But then me and Jessica were talking about this morning, and maybe because we had Ben with us, her son, maybe that had a little bit to do with... Or sometimes it's just simply because there's a female present, too. Meaning Jessica, that they get a little little antsy when there's a woman around, especially if they're juveniles. Well, another possibility is, you know, it, this is territory that Jessica and her team frequent. You are an unknown vector. Well, I was there last year, though. Yeah, but a year? Well, I mean, yeah, a year had passed. Uh, to answer your question, Ryan, no, this was before you spoke today. This was last night. So I don't think you, I mean, unless you, you know, and I, maybe you have one of those dark moments where I you're do, like tapping the watch. I do them. have a shaved head. So, it was a figure speech, brother. <laughs> you see, William said he said shave shave the hair on the back of my neck. It is shaved, but I still felt it. I think it's the only there. one that's not fully challenged. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm not as good <laughs> as I used to be, but I definitely got y'all beat. Don't take much. We got you in the chin department, though. 
There you go. And I went to, to my parents this uh, this weekend or this week while I was gone, and uh, got to see my my younger brother. And uh, poor guy's got a he shaves his hair pretty close, kind of wears a high and tight, but his forehead starts about here now. And uh, then he's so got a so it's a five head, pretty much. And now he's got a little a uh, little sunlight right where the yarmulke would go. And uh, at the uh, jail where he works, they call him Bird. And uh, I asked him why they call him that, and they told him because he looks like a newborn bird with the little pin feathers. <laughs> my dad, when I was growing up, my dad was bald, like right up here, but he let the hair get pretty long on the sides. So he had this like fuzzy ring around the top of his head with the top of his head being completely bald. And when Annette and I started dating, she met my dad. I t- she was saying, you, you know, you know, your dad's that bald. You may maybe lose it because I had a full head of hair when her I started dating. I'm like, yeah. I said, but I made myself a promise a long time ago. She says, what's that? I said, once the top's gone, the sides are coming with it. I'm not going to walk around like, looking like I got a fuzzy toilet ring on my head. You don't want the fryer tuck, huh? No, <laughs> yeah. no fryer tuck for me. Thank you. No. Mine's even worse than that. Mine's like right there. The ball spot is like right there in the back in the center. So, you know, I, I like run the risk of blinding people who are driving behind me if the sun's shining behind us. So, you know, I just like because it'll focus on that one small spot. <laughs> Be roasting ants. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, my but, my dad's got a full head of hair, um, thick, thick hair. Uh, but uh, they say you get your hairline from your maternal grandfather. Well, my maternal grandfather was bald as a billiard cue, and uh, he uh, he lost his during the Korean War just about overnight. And uh, they said it was related to shock, some type of, action he encountered when he was there. Uh, and then uh, of my four uncles, two of them have great hairline. The other two got next to nothing. So it could go either way. I was going to enjoy it while it lasts. I don't blame you. Hey, Steve, you're, you're from the Farmington area originally, right? Right. Well, I grew up in Farmington. Yeah. Do you know where Lesterville is? Yeah, yeah, Lesterville is uh, kind of in the direction of uh, Fredericktown, the place where my wife grew up. I uh, I just heard about a, a, a daylight sighting just outside of there. Ooh. Someone Lesterville someone was, isn't too far from those vampire graves that I was telling you about a while back. Uh, they were the driving into the, the rod iron. They were driving into the into the uh, the Mark Twain from there, and said they had one just bold as bold as hell cross right across from them, across on, in the road in front of them so they were the only car they didn't see another car you know in either direction sure. but it it walked it just very boldly walked out looked at him and just kept right on walking was this a squatch we're talking about or a dog man yeah. bigfoot 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 it was a, between six and seven feet tall and uh, had like uh, uh black hair with like reddish streaks in it sweet we that might, might be to, a fun one to check go do out. some nighttime driving in the Mark Twain, man. Seriously, head out, head out that way, and uh, and uh, you maybe round up my uh, my brother, and you know, shoot. My oh, dad yeah. would probably go with if you think it gave him a chance to use his gun. <laughs> I'm kind of scared to be around when your dad uses his gun. No offense. Me too. Me too. Maybe we should replace his ammunition with blanks. Hey, you know, the funniest time is when he tried to show me his taser flashlight in the car and he dropped it and it fell in his lap while it was, you know, lit. Ouch. Ouch. Yep. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he, let's just say he won't have the balls to try that again. <laughs> Ouch. <Da-doom, doom. laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we, we may have to have to take the old grocery getter out there where we've got the, you know, the good GPS and Wi-Fi and just kind of see what we can see. The, the Mark Twain is, is there's so many stories that come out of there. Uh, and some of the most recent ones I've been hearing were coming up on the far side of Lake of the Ozarks. And that's, I know that's not the Mark Twain at all, but so, I, so I've, I've heard like half a dozen stories here recently from the other side of Lake of the Ozarks. Um, you know, uh, over where they're building that resort with the island, Overpass there, mm. which is on the backside of Bagnell Dam. 
you know, Lister so Bill we have is. To, we may have to, ooh, may have to make a day trip or, you know, a couple of day trips up there and see what we can find. So Lester Bill is a little further south than I thought it was. So I grew up in St. Francis County, um, just kind of south and west of that. You've got um, Madison County, where my wife kind of grew up, and then uh, Reynolds County and Iron County both touch. Reynolds County is where Lester Bill is. It's kind of at the intersection of 21, 49, and 72. Those are all Missouri highways. Um, but it's also at the same county where Tom Sock Mountain is, you know, Missouri's high point. So mm -hmm. some of that stuff is pretty woolly out there. Um, it's, there's not a whole hell of a lot to it. And, uh, I, uh, it's one of those unincorporated areas. So it's, you know, probably only a couple hundred people if you were to add them all together. Uh, but, uh, it'd be interesting. Definitely worth the, worth the trip. It, you know, it'd be close enough that we could, uh, you know, back off to Farmington as a base camp. I was, uh, talking to a guy here recently, um, ran into him at Walmart of all places. And I happened to have one of my Bigfoot t-shirts on and he commented on it. And of course that, you know, struck up a conversation. And, uh, he said, he said, uh, believe it or not, I actually saw one. I'm like, really? What happened? He said he was fishing up on the big piney river, which, you know, you know where that's at. Uh, up, uh, uh, he said it was, uh, below Rolla. So he was, you know, pretty far down on the big piney. Um, but he said, uh, he said he was fishing on the big piney and he kept hearing rocks at the water. And uh, he was looking around and he said, I wasn't really paying attention to the opposite bank. I was looking to see if somebody like somebody's kids were splashing in the water. And um, he said he couldn't see anybody that was in the water. He says, but then I just get this unnerving feeling like I was being watched. And he said, I so I looked across the right, like almost straight across from me and started looking back and forth in the bushes. He says, and I saw from about like shoulders up of this thing sticking out of the trees, just staring at me. And it throws a rock right at me. It says it hit the water, not 10 feet from me. I said, what'd you do? He goes, went back to my campsites. What I did. Yeah. That's when you, uh, D asked the AO. Hey, he, uh, he said the weird thing. And he said, I don't know if this is related at all. He said there are feral hogs in that area and you can hear them at night. He said the dog that I, he says, my dog, he said, I had a blue healer. Uh, that I always took camping with me that night. He got to barking at something, went out in the woods and never saw him again. He said, now nah, I can't say that's Bigfoot related. It could be bear, could be mountain lion, could be, could be those feral hogs. He said, but my dog went after something and I never saw it again. Mm -mm. No, thank you. So take that, take that for what you will. You know, that could be uh, an aggressive Bigfoot or, you know, from, Feral hogs can and will kill dogs. So will coyotes, so will wolves, and so will mountain lions. So whatever happened, that dog jumped on something it shouldn't have jumped on, and the dog never made it back. You know, I uh, knowing what I know now about, you know, cryptozoology of Missouri, I think when I was in Boy Scouts, I think we used to tell stories of sightings of the Ozarks Howler um, because uh, – uh, there was a critter uh, that you know supposedly hung out around the Beaumont Scout Camp under St. Louis. They used to call it the Beaumont, Man uh, Beaumont Monster. And the way they described the thing was a howler. Uh, you know, it's like a you know big black cat, hellish dog, horns. You know, this kind of thing. And uh, you know, uh, you know, scream that'll turn your blood cold. And uh, you know, when I got got it's older, like I was just assumed. Yeah, that's, you know, when I was, uh, you know, got older, I just assumed it was a, you know, a melanistic, you know, mountain lion, uh, you know, it's black jaguars or whatever, because, you know, you see those around Missouri every once in a while. And, uh, but then I'm like, mm, they don't have horns. And then I read about the, the howler. I'm like, oh, well, shit, that's what it is. <laughs> I don't feel so good about camping up there. Corey Cole's got a good point. He says, or it got coaxed out and taken out quietly. It's entirely possible. But he said, he said he won't yeah. fish or camp in that area anymore after that. He said, I don't know what got the dog. He says, but I know what was throwing rocks at me and I won't camp or fish anywhere near there. He goes, now I camp and fish down at Roaring River. And I go, funny, you should mention Roaring River. He's like, don't tell me. I, I don't, am I going to have to find another campground now? So when I was heading back from Farmington this past week, uh, I uh, think I saw my first dead bear. Um, you know, we always talk about how you don't see bear, you know, dead or whatever. I didn't stop. I was, you know, zipping by on, on Missouri Route 8, but down in a, in a little ravine off the side of the road there. And if you ever during that road, you know, there's no shoulders, everything. It's got like a, you know, 
six degree gray, just right off the edge of the road. And mm -hmm. I saw what looked like the body of a black bear uh, down the ditches that went by. And I all, if I would have had a shoulder, I would have stopped and walked back to check it out. Um, but I was like, that's awful close to the road. You know, maybe it got hit and got slung down there. Uh, maybe. but you know, it's just enough that, you know, you drive long enough, you know, what roadkill looks like. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, not a deer, not an armadillo. I'm like, that was kind of under the category of what the hell was that? And, uh, you know, it was big enough that it wasn't a you know dog or something like that. Uh, but I, I was kind of, even if you'd have gone back, you might've just solved the whole Bigfoot mystery. Might've been a dead well, Bigfoot I was, laying there. I was going to say, I was joking around myself about, you know, watch if watch me go back. It's a damn dog, man. Yeah. <laughs> The yeah, other I just night, picture Bigfoot is being red, you know, the, the, the kind of orangutan color. Mm -hmm. um, the other night, Noah and I were going out to, to get Taco Bell. It was around one o'clock in the morning. And we were driving down out of my neighborhood up toward Chestnut. And as we're driving down the down Burton, my headlights lit up uh, one of the neighbor's mailboxes. And it looked like a person was leaning over the mailbox, like watching the cars. And I looked at it, did a double take. And I said, Noah, did you see that? And he goes, he goes, I didn't see it. So I get to the end of the block and I turn around and I come back and uh, lo and behold, it's a freaking shrub, but they've carved it in deliberately to look like a person standing there. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't like features or anything, but it's got the shape. And may I about cracked myself because I thought there was someone or something standing there watching us go by. And now every time I drive by, I just look at it and go, one of these days I'm going to come up here and cut that damn thing down. There is a, a house uh, in uh, Crawford County that has these, I think they're probably cardboard or metal silhouettes up on the side of their house. And there's one that looks like a dude in a 10 gallon hat, just kind of with his arms folded. And they got another one that looks like a Bigfoot. And I'm like, you know, with all the people in Missouri that, you know, have guns and <laughs> know about this kind of stuff, it's surprising everybody shot the damn thing. Around here? Yeah. I knew a guy up in Lebanon that had ceramic deer in his front yard and they weren't even full, full size and they got shot routinely. Yeah. Uh, Estelle Harrington says, my dog did a dance with a mother black bear in the yard. She treed her three cubs. I was afraid the bear would get the dog before we could get our hands on her. Bears will tear a dog up. Mm -hmm. David By says, those Bigfoot silhouettes are everywhere. You drive down between, um, what is that little town in Oklahoma? Um, it's not Miami, is it? No, no, it's not Miami. Um, Adair, but from Adair, Oklahoma to um, all the way down to Durant, you can't go more than a few miles without seeing one of those Bigfoot signs. In fact, there's even one that's called the Bigfoot Dispensary. It's a it's a it's a pot dispensary called the Bigfoot Dispensary. Bigfoot Trap House is what it's called, but it's a dispensary. And uh, well, it it, up. it's all part of their their marketing uh, project. You know, you uh, you take something that they sell you and they smoke it, and when you start seeing Bigfoot. You know that's the right blend for you, and you know you you pay for it. That's the that's the good stuff. Robbie, heard any more uh, sightings in your area? Uh, yeah, me and Johnny was talking um, the other day, and he said that uh, one of his regulars that comes in the le leather shop that knows we do the show and everything uh was telling him that somebody was uh saying that let's see if i can get the uh i want to say it, it was on highway 11 but it was on closer to the maybe to the north carolina side of it still in south carolina but it was a a good ways on up but said that uh they either it had crossed the road in front of somebody or somebody was stopped on the road because they'd hit a deer or something, something to do with the road. And they, and it, they saw it on it. Cause this is like what fourth, fourth hand at this point or something like that. So it, it's hard to remember exactly how it got relayed, but basically somewhere up closer to the North Carolina side, probably pretty close to where we heard, uh, or, where uh, 
the little boy got taken or in that general area anyway but it was either it was crossing the road or they stopped and saw it at walking up a hill after it had crossed the road so he, he's trying to run that down right now and see if we can get somebody that actually was there and it not coming through like four or five other people and the uh, what Sonny's talking about the horse pasture that's a uh, that's where uh pickens county's got a bear hunting camp that we're right in the middle of deer season is bear season in pickens county in zone one so the horse pasture is where that bear camp is and she's asking if uh if i think there's cryptids in there and yes i have i've heard uh many stories i've heard stories from firemen who uh worked that station up there things hitting the station late at night you know most of them just write it off as things falling off the tree or whatever but uh, a couple buddies of mine worked up there and they said they'd be sound asleep and hear something hit the side of the building and not like something drop off the roof but i'm talking like you know up high but like on the side of the building not on the roof and then there's times that things hit the roof of the building and they actually went up there and cut some of the trees back so they wouldn't have any overhang but there's still stuff hitting the roofs at times um there's been plenty of stories where they've gone out on a call and as they were pulling the truck out of the bay and getting ready to turn on the on the road seeing a big now they all think it's a it's bear because like i said that's right up there where the bear camp is so it's it's, it's always a big black bear but uh oh, there's yeah. a, big, a big black shape go across the road now some of the guys that, that i know have said yeah i know they say it's a bear but it looked like it was on two legs that doesn't generally happen with bears not for any distance anyway not mm. running across the road. reach for something or or that's about or if they're trying to threaten you you know i've so, seen them yes. do that kind of red panda thing where they've got the you know the arms up trying to look big yes sonny to answer your question i i do believe they're they're and i, I gotta check in I, i'm not sure if that is considered state for national park service or for park service or national but I and I know it's a park and it's under uh, game wardens patrol it regularly and there's times when it's locked off and you can't because people used to go in there and ride four wheelers all the time or go take four wheel drives up to there's a it's called Lookout Rock people go up there and back off I, my dad used to take me up there all the time we go up there at night and just kind of look off the rock I mean you can see the entire county and see all the way over into Greenville County um, beautiful view but the DNR is pretty regular in there. They're and they're strict. You don't do anything wrong in that place, or they will they will make you regret it. Because we all know how much power DNR's got. Them game oh, yeah. can do pretty much whatever they want to do. So uh, well, I, I was, found uh, out something. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say I was filling up for gas on my way out of Farmington this this past week, and I was there at the same time as a uh, Missouri Conservation Officer was, and uh, he had a K nine vehicle with us giant black Malinois named Tex in there. And, you know, I, I wanted so bad to pet the dog, but I noticed on his gun rack in the back of his car, uh, he had uh, what looked like a 30 out six, some kind of a bolt action rifle. And they had a pretty tricked out AR hanging in the gun rack. I'm like, you know, when DNR starts carrying uh, tricked out ARs, uh, I didn't get a super good look at it, but it looked like it might've been a Daniel defense AR. And I'm like, yeah, they're 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 armed a little better than most guys are. You know, the hundred twenty pound you know dog was pretty cool. Yeah, you, know. you know the DNR guys when they, they go out to check parks and stuff, those guys are very highly likely to walk up on an illegal marijuana grow. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah, those guys a, uh, probably should be armed pretty heavily. There was a shooting, uh, kind of on the Missouri Tennessee border recently. Uh, it was an officer involved shooting, and this guy uh, came up and he. Uh, he opened up on a on a uh, this chief of police and his partner, and uh, ended up killing them. And they sent units after them and whatever. And ultimately, it was a uh, a uh, conservation officer who just happened to respond to the mutual assistance call that took him out. And uh, the uh, conservation guy pulled up with a uh, a uh, an AR, emptied the entire magazine into the vehicle, 
backed up and then uh, when the one of the aggressors took up out of the vehicle he took him down and uh it was uh, a couple of uh of individuals that that uh that don't exactly follow the same set of laws that the rest of us do you'd be acquainted mm-hmm. with them da and yeah. so my brother was telling me the story this week and i'm like I'll have to tell da about that one have the same feeling i do about it yeah i, I really uh, did not like dealing with those guys and i ran into ran into them fairly frequently shockingly there are a lot of them in southwest missouri yeah well he killed there are a lot in southeast missouri apparently but killed two cops chief of police wasn't even carrying a gun he was from a small town in tennessee where i guess it was like a you know mayberry and uh the uh his partner had a wheel gun on him and uh they were both seriously well, they were outmatched, obviously outmatched from the and, get uh, but the uh, the dnr guy was uh, better armed obviously <laughs> and uh like i said had enough time to empty a mag do a tactical uh j turn and then pop out with another magazine and <laughs> engage so uh they it seems those two individuals might have died of lead poisoning well you know what is it uh, the old expression fafo mm-hmm and they F-O-ed F-O-ed and I'm they not. F-O'd. Yep. But, uh, but, yeah, my brother was telling me about that. And uh, I'd forgotten uh, until just now about it. He's like, uh, tell DA that story. Because I guess you guys were talking about the, that organization at my wedding. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. Tell DA. He'd be interested. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I, Dude, I used to dread walking up on a vehicle when I make a traffic stop when I knew it was one of those guys. I mean, you, you can usually tell by the bullshit handmade license plate or uh, a sign in the window that says, I'm not driving, I'm traveling or something like that. <laughs> right. You can almost, you can, you know, How you pull time? them over and you almost cringe because you're like, and every time I ever stopped one, every time the first thing that went my head, it went through my head was the, the shooting in West Memphis, Tennessee, uh, no, West Memphis, Arkansas, right across from Tennessee. In West Memphis, mm-hmm. when those two officers pulled two of them over and they opened up with AKs, killed both the cops in seconds. Yep. Ironically, that these went guys through had my AKs head too. every time I, I pulled, I pulled yeah. one of them over. Yeah, these guys had AKs. Um, but, uh, so it was funny. Every time you... I pulled one over, I thought, is, is, it to, is it today? Is this the day? Yep. When I pulled into Walmart's parking lot the other night, there was a, an Oklahoma vehicle. It had Oklahoma tribal plates on it, and they were expired in 07. And I was like, way to go, Springfield. Stay on top of that. I think that's the record for the longest expired plates I've seen. Uh, uh, no, not even close. Pulled a guy over. his. Ta- I swear to God, his tags expired in 1987. The reason why I spotted it oh, is it was the old wow. plate. The red plate that's like made yeah, out the of old steel. red Missouri plate. I was like, why is that even on the road? And, you know, yeah. you, you can get those plates for, like, historical vehicles. This was not. This was a ragged-out beater mobile that they'd found some right. tag and stuck it on there. And I'm like, man, they haven't even issued those tags in 30 years. No, well, my first car had one of those on it. And uh, those things were made of, like, AR-500 steel. <laughs> yeah, you could damn it up a bullet with those things. But yeah, that's the <laughs> oldest one I pulled over. And uh, I backed up another buddy of mine one night on a DUI, and I rolled up and uh, – this uh, this gentleman, I won't say his profession or or his name, but this gentleman was passing the field sobriety tests, and we could we could smell alcohol just rolling off this guy. And I looked over at him. I'm like, you better have him. You better have him. You know, blowing uh, blowing the breathalyzer. I said because this guy was clearly a professional alcoholic. He'd been drinking heavily and was still <laughs> walking and talking fine. Um, That's funny. He no nystagmus. Like, he's just doing great. Yeah, he blew, blew a point four two. Oh, that's like I don't know how he was alive. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he was alive. Alcohol poisoning comes in at what point three something, Steve? Point two mm-hmm. eight? Something like I yeah, point three, point three two, depending on who you talk to. This guy uh, had had yeah. to have been drinking heavily for years to be well, able that to. Get he those he might have been a type one diabetic. On top of that, uh, to have I numbers that high. You. But I, I know yeah, I looked at yeah, the results. Blood is alcohol. Yeah, pretty much. I looked at the results and he goes, no. So I went and got mine out of the car and had him do it again. And like, you got to be freaking kidding me. How's this guy alive? Yeah, he can draw blood and it's got a head on it. Yeah. 
Yeah, pretty uh, much. Yeah. I, I was astounded. At least I didn't have to take it to court. It wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, when my brother got credentialed uh, to teach courses on field sobriety tests, uh, we were all in town, uh, me and my wife and his wife and, and him, and uh, we were all drinking in a typical typical Monroe's family gathering. There was, there was large amounts of alcohol involved. And uh, my brother started sobriety testing us. And uh, uh, both my wife and I passed the sobriety test. Like we had no nystagmus, our eyes were steady and everything. And he's like, that's creepy because I would pass you. I would pass you in a heartbeat. And he didn't have a breathalyzer on him. I wish he would have had it because I would have liked to know what it was. Uh, you know, me, I can understand. I mean, I'm an Irish German with 25 years of practice, but my wife really didn't drink until we got together. And then still it's very rarely. She just handles it well. Uh, but yeah, we were passing and it's like, kind of makes you wonder about those field sobriety tests sometimes. Yeah, some people can pass fields. And then there are, there are some guys, one of my sergeants, uh, he had a natural nystagmus. So every time you would try to try to do, get him to do the eye thing, his eyes were already twitching and he hadn't had a drop of alcohol. He just had one naturally. Yeah. Well, uh, so I had discovered something. And uh, mm -hmm. it's going to require some research. Uh, on my part and do some digging and maybe some calling around and talking to other cops I know in the state of Missouri. But I just found something out uh, and I thought I should share it with you boys. You know how on Table Rock Lake there's Joe Bald and Combs Ferry that I know of, closed campgrounds. Mm -hmm. I've discovered that there's at least one on Stockton Lake, which means there are probably others on other lakes. Interesting. Campgrounds, they have shut down with no explanation. And the one on Stockton, they bulldozed it off just like Combs Ferry. Hmm. Why do you bulldo hmm. bulldoze off a campground? Especially on a popular tourist area. Yeah. Well, it's like something when they, they keep the one in Joe Bald shut down. We're like, this yeah, is something prime weird is going around. It's so sad we can't get a FOIA request or something to find out what's going on. Well, the FOIA requests only reply, work on uh, on uh, uh, criminal cases or missing persons. You can't do a FOIA request on you know the the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers on why they closed the campground. There's yeah. not going to be anything for them to tell you. Hmm. So I've got a feeling that at least all the big man-made lakes in Missouri probably all have some of these these campgrounds that have been shut down with no explanation. I wish that uh, that individual that I pointed you towards would have come through with, and contacted you. I do too, because uh, I would love to know what's going on there. I think that would have filled in some some gaps, because uh, unprovoked, he gave me a lot of information, which I shared all of with you. But you know, third party information doesn't help much. Yeah, it's but it still very confirmed a lot of what I already knew and what we both suspected. Yeah. Well, but as long and as long as you don't use third party information to be your basis of oh this right. is it, you can use it to corroborate stuff all day long. Yeah, the, what what that guy well, said basically corroborates everything that we already knew about Joe Bald, both from our own research and from time spent down there. Right. If this was a criminal case. He gave us enough that wasn't quite enough to get a warrant, unless we had a pretty uh, pretty cooperative judge. But it was enough to at least point you in the right direction to get the, the evidence you needed to get a warrant, you know. Randall Kildare says, couldn't have anything to do with all the border jumpers not wanting hospitable terrain for them to claim, could it? I don't think so. Uh, we're talking... Now, these talking were closed before the immigrant crisis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these were closed, you know, 20 years ago plus. I know Joe Bald, Noah and I were just down there the other day, and we were driving around, and now, since, the you know, the leaves haven't budded back out, we're looking at a lot of these campgrounds, and I'm like, dude, we could back in here and throw a tent. These campgrounds are, these 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 these, these campsites are fine. There's well, a few of them that are damaged, some of them that have, like, had the, 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 uh, the picnic tables broken and things like that. Interesting how they broke steel reinforced concrete without leaving any hammer marks, but okay, we'll, we'll let that one go. But some of those campgrounds in there, well, some of those campsites, you could back a, back a camper in and set up. Do you remember when we were, we were over there, we saw somebody that had a tent set up that was out there. Remember the people that were out there? Cause when we went back around after we got out and looked at that, uh, that 
power box that was miraculously in a primitive campsite. In a primitive campsite. Who knew? Uh, we drove back around that circle, and they because you were like, what's that? Is that? Yep, that's a tent. They had a tent set up over there. Hey, check this out. Wyatt Estes just says, DA, look up Cow Creek on Table Rock Lake. I think it is. I think it's a campground that's shut down as well. Uh, Wyatt, if I'm Wyatt, you and I were talking about trying to get into uh, into uh, um, um, Ants not Ants Creek into um, the the one that's bulldozed off. Um, Combs Ferry. We were talking. We were talking. He was one of the guys I was talking to. With it, may have a boat to get us in there. Um, uh, another guy I know has a boat in that area too. But if you know where Cow Creek is, let me know because I've never even heard of it. And I thought I knew of the all the campgrounds around Table Rock. Uh, but what I'm discovering is is if there's ones like on St on Stockton, because I haven't spent as near as much time on Stockton Lake, uh, but I used to spend quite a bit of time up on Truman Lake, uh, and there, there were a bunch of campgrounds around Truman. So I think what I may do is just load up the car, fill up the tank, and go drive around these lakes and look for some of these, look and see how many of these shutdown campgrounds I can find. Because I don't think they're going to really make anything public about why these things are shut down or even the fact that they are shut down. So how I found Joe Bald was uh, I was going down there looking for places to, to camp and uh, while well, we'd camped in Joe Bald before, but how I found it, you know, after it was closed down, I didn't know it was still had been shut down. Was I was looking for active campgrounds down there, places to go camp for us, the family to go. And Ants Creek popped up on Google search, and I remembered the, the camping in that area. And the Ant Ants Creek was the only one that was showing up on Google searches. So I'm like, Ants Creek had to have been the one we camped at. And then a buddy of mine told me, he says, you know about the old abandoned one down that way too, and. Uh, I said, no. And he said, Joe Bald. And that's when it started clicking. And I went down there and realized that's actually the one we camped out when I was young. Uh, but that, mm. you know, there's, there's nothing. You can't find anything online about why it's shut down now. Yeah. And there was some information until you and I started digging and all of a sudden those websites are gone. Yeah. We have, we found uh, eight or nine references to missing persons directly in or around that campground mm -hmm. yep. and eight, then when we went back we went back to get them and print them out to use for use for resource material and they were gone The you know websites yep. we got four or four everything. errors yeah dead links um you know if if this uh this little investigation just happens to happen on a weekend or when i'm off i realize you got a wingman in noah but if you need a need another wingman hey i will never holler. say no to an extra extra pistola hey i was gonna say i will uh I will gladly, uh, you know, come equipped. And the, the, this whole thing with Joe Bald, you know, the the inter you know, discovering all the backstory and the weirdness and getting capturing stuff on video started with me and you anyway. Well, yeah, that's true. Two morons, no waiting, right? Exactly. We had no idea what we were walking into. Uh, no, no, and it's it's interesting how this has all progressed now that you mentioned that, you know. Um, cause truthfully, what has it been two years now that we started this little journey and, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a, a opportunity to give your books a little more visibility and for me to live out some of my fangirl fantasies about interacting with DA Roberts. And, uh, <laughs> before I know it, it's kind of developed a little life of its own and God bless, God bless Robbie for, for just running with it. You know, I, uh, I still yeah, feel I like I'm kind of, what'd you say, brother? I said, and I don't run very good. <laughs> well, Miss Lene says that about there. Miss Lene says about ten years ago they shut down several of the horse and hiking trails in the Shawnee National Forest near their farm. Said it was because of a type of flower. Now I wonder. Yeah, I don't buy that for a second because their trails are already established. Flowers don't grow on the trails. All they would have to do is put up signs like "Don't ride your horses off the trails because of these endangered flowers." That's all they'd have to do. Right. So shutting the trail down, that's a little suspect, yeah. if you, in my opinion. Well, there's some wilderness areas in um, in the uh, SRF Scout Ranch, uh, Knob Lake, Missouri, where I grew up. And they have some areas in the ranger area, the more primitive camping area, that uh, they discovered that rosy periwinkles grow. And I guess they're a flower that's fairly endangered. It's used in some kind of cancer treatment. 
And so they put up basically like chicken wire on the edges of the trail. And, you know, there's warning signs that, you know, like this is an endangered plant. It has this medicinal value, blah, blah, blah. Don't leave the trails. Well, of course, it's a bunch of Boy Scouts, so they don't leave the trails. Uh, you know, you don't have to close down the whole campground. Right. I, uh, I, I, I tell you, the other night when Noah and I were down in Joe Bald, it, it, it just astounded me how good a shape, even after that place has been empty for 25 years, it astounded me how good a shape some of those campsites were in. You literally could have backed in, pitched a tent, and set up camp. They, they were they were in as good a shape as they were probably when they were made. And I just, I can't believe that, you know, their, their, their park wasn't shut down, obviously, because the, the place was, was, was broken down. Even the roads are still travelable. They're just, you know, right, the, the brush has grown up right up to the edge of the roads. Um, yeah, they're, they're a little uh, washboardy, but they're travelable. Right. There, there's some cracks in them and stuff, but after nobody's done any maintenance on that place and, you know, better part of 25 years, the place is still in remarkably good shape. Well, that's what happens when you have launch there. That's what happens when you have your own personal twenty-four hour service that's yeah. out there all the time. Yeah, right. I was about to say, yeah, you got those those twenty-four hour service guys with the panel van. The well, ones that speaking offer of the, the three Wi-Fi to children. <laughs> sp yeah, speaking of the twenty-four hour service, the other day when Noah and I were down there, we got down there. There was still quite a bit of daylight left. We didn't see any sign of any of those service vans. There was nobody down there. But there were maybe a dozen people down at the water's edge by the boat ramp playing in the water. There were some folks with their dogs down there. And no one and I were finding some spots to, to you know, to, to to shoot a couple of shorts for the channel. And we we're just walking around and, you know, looking in that area where you and I, where you and I were at, Robbie, where we, you and Noah were at. Mm -hmm. We we're looking over that area and, uh, you know, we were just kind of all over that end, that end. And they were way down by the end of the boat ramp, quite a ways away from us. And the sun was getting lower in the sky. And Noah and I had stopped and filmed a couple of times. And uh, Noah, Noah was at the camera, and I had my back to the lake. And uh, the sun was going down behind me, and it was starting to dip below the bluff on the other side of the lake. And Noah goes, huh. I'm like, what? And he goes, look. And I looked over at that parking area where the boat ramp was. Every one of them guys were gone. As soon as it, the sun started to dip, they were all gone. They they got out of that park fast. They were over there, and then just every single one of them vanished before the sun dipped down. Weird. I hey, big guy. Sun's getting pretty low. <laughs> yeah, and Which Noah's like, "Time to go." <laughs> Noah's like, um, "Are you getting the same feeling I'm feeling?" I'm like, "Yeah, like maybe we ought to, you know, pick up and and film another day." So. Uh, <laughs> We started heading back. Uh, we started heading back toward the car, which was about, I'd say, 70, 80 yards from where we were shoot, where we were filming. And uh, as we were walking across the gravel back toward where the car was parked, we were parked pretty close where we were with you, Robbie, in that same general area. Yeah. And as we're walking in that over in the the brush where that that blind was at, we could hear footsteps in the brush, and Noah's like. Dad, I'm like, yeah, I hear it. <laughs> let's uh, let's pack up our stuff and get the hell out of here. Because it was just the two of us, and we were both just carrying little nines. So I wasn't in the I wasn't in the um, in the carrying capacity for dealing with something big. Mm -mm. David By says it celebrates 20 months of membership, dude. Thank you. He says I want to go spend a few a few hours out there at night, just sit quiet. That place is is dead quiet even in the day. Uh, you can hear animals and birds and stuff like farther down the lake at outside mm -hmm. the park. But that whole area right there around the, the Joe Bald camp itself, dead quiet, even even during broad daylight. Uh, and Robbie it reminds can tell me you of there, the uh, Tommy knockers. You know, yeah. Where like like the where the matches wouldn't work and everything was just kind of right. gray and quiet. Yeah. Uh, Robbie's been down there and so has Steve. They've, we've we've all been down there at night. And there are a few houses just outside that old old campground. There's quite a few. There's a few people that live down there on that peninsula because it is. It's a peninsula out into the lake, so there are people that live in the area. Uh, and they all act pretty bizarre. And every one of those houses have so many outdoor security lights. It's like they're lit up for Christmas. Yeah, there are those places that you you want to picture a lake house having, uh, you know, high gauge steel around their windows and stuff like this. You're like. 
You mean like the, the crazy ones that were driving, the crazy uh, people that were driving around on the golf cart while we were walking around in it yeah. drove by five times. Yeah, the, the, the like people down there won't minutes. watch you. They won't talk to you, or if they do, they don't say much. Uh, but yeah, they were they were watching us pretty close, wanting to know what the hell we were doing down there. It's almost worth knocking on doors and introducing yourself as a writer and just see what they say to you. You know, we tried that, and uh, we, we, the guy wouldn't give us a comment one way or the other. Mm. Uh, Josh Jones asked him if he knew anything about cryptids. He goes, no, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. And Josh goes, no, no. no. And he explained what a cryptid was, and the guy looks at him, and he goes, yeah, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency, and walked off. <laughs> That's funny. Josh is like, okay, that's not weird. <laughs> nah. Right. <laughs> oh, it's like that. Uh, oh, hell. What was the name of that uh, that film? Uh, oh, crap. Can't think of what it's called. Where the, the whole town is basically made up of synthetic people. Oh, Stepford I think Wife. I yeah, Stepford Wife. Yeah, it's like Stepford Wife stuff. It's like, there's no Bigfoot here. Yeah, exactly. Boys, can you do me a favor? Can you uh, can kind of keep things running for the next two or three minutes while I uh, step across the hallway? I'll be right back. We'll do our best. I don't know. So, what TV, is how are you doing? I'm swell. That's good, Steve. I'm glad you're swell. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he so, meant by keeping it going as us doing our Sith's Law impersonations. <laughs> Well, remember, the original podcast was Two Assholes No Waiting. It didn't say which two assholes we were talking about. <laughs> Only we're just waiting for the other one. So, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> right, two assholes who are waiting. I don't know. Uh, so, if you had to to put a pin in it and, and you go on record and say what you thought it was, that encounter you had down there in Georgia the other day, would you think it more of the uh, Sasquatch variety or more of the Dogman variety? Okay. I'm going to preface this by saying... I honestly do not know what it was. Of course, of course, yeah. But no, no judgment. <laughs> the, top to bottom, a hundred percent different, or a hundred eighty degree different from the encounter last year. Every everything was different. Everything felt different, and I won't say it was like ominous, but and I told DA this last night. I immediately, when I turned back around and saw those shadows, my brain went immediately to Dog Man, just because of the way they were kind of bounding around. Now, does that mean that's what it was? No, that just that's where when I turned back around and saw what I saw, that's immediately where my where my brain went was Dog Man, and I, I told Da that last night. I said, you know, now Jessica said. She said Skinwalker, but DA pointed out, and I'm not saying that I've, but he pointed out, he said, well, I've never heard of a case where multiple Skinwalkers work together. But she mm -hmm. did say that, you know, uh, Ben has really been watching, big on watching the Skinwalker Ranch here lately. So that's kind of like in oh, her yeah. subconscious. So she feels like that's probably why she said that. Because when, once we talked about it again this morning, she goes, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, yes, David. I was breathing, right? So, yes, my weapon was immediately on target. Uh, but that that was just the turning around and seeing seeing that and seeing the way that movement was going. That, like I said, what I, the movement I'd seen before was like kind of slow and back and forth this way. That's why I was like, maybe it is the fog, maybe. But when I turned back around, mm -hmm. it was like. And they were just well, like my, like leapfrog my impression you. from your story yeah. was was more of a of a Bigfoot type variety, um, just because it was it seemed to be more kind of driven to what you were doing. But of course, I wasn't there. You know, I've never been encountered either one. Thank God. Um, but just the fact that they were kind of intelligently checking you out. You know, yeah, but it's like the, uh, like he was saying that it was like they were leapfrogging towards me. Is that's that is the perfect description of what what I saw, what they what it looked like they were doing. Hmm. 
and it, it just seemed it was like really fast and that really fast fluid movement and think back the very first uh underworld movie you remember when mm-hmm. celine's in the uh in the apartment out in the hallway and she looks and they're coming towards her and they're kind of leapfrogging off the walls and off the ceiling that but we just dark shadows and you can't see what it is but that that is exactly what i saw when i turned around that type of movement so how close did they get before you were bugging out well see that's the thing i we were just seeing that was probably before we decided to move the movement was probably 30 to 40 yards away just just on the peripheral you know just we were the hills like this so like say this is the crest of the hill we were like right here mm-hmm. and you still had to go up and up. So they were like on the, where the tree line was. So when we turned and started walking around or walking back and when I turned back around and, and saw what I saw, I would say that was in more like the 15 to 20 yard radius. So, so you had 30, to, 30 to 40 at first. And then when I turned right back around 15 to 20, if you had to guess how big would you say they were? Well, I don't know because they were close to the ground. When when I turn oh, back so around, they, like you think they were on all fours? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. The the, the scene in uh uh underworld world, that's that was the yeah. kind of movement like they were on all fours, mo- bounding around. Sounds more like Delta Mike's than uh, Bravo Foxtrot, doesn't it? Not necessarily. The could be, uh, could the, have been good are, are known to, especially I've seen I've, I've heard walking. stories of people who've seen them on all fours chasing deer because. You know, much like a gorilla, a gorilla is capable of moving pretty quick, you know, upright. But when it gets on all fours, those things can really truck. So I would say it's a very, you know, very similar to that. It's if it's a primate species of it, and, and, and I include, include humans in that primate, in that primate species category, you know, they very well could move much faster on the, on all fours. It, it's possible that they are not fully bipedal, that they are capable of bipedal movement. But that's not their that's not their con, you know continued mode of operation that they're more than capable of doing more than one. What do y'all think? Like, like I said, that's maybe it was because you know I was thinking about that movie when I saw that and thinking about that scene. Maybe that's why I, my my mind thought. Sure. Dog man. Well, to me, mine, mine, mine went more with the uh, when they introduced the Urukai in the uh, Lord of the Rings films. Um, you know, when they're pointing out, it's like, oh yeah, you know what the orcs are? Yeah. Well, these are the dark side of that, and you know, they show the the Iroquois kind of or Urukai. I'm probably mispronouncing Uruk- it. Urukai coming in. Urukai. Um, I remember watching that, you know, not being real familiar with uh, with the you know the the universe of the Lord of the Rings, and just being absolutely terrified with the way they were just kind of closing in on everything, and uh, and of course, then you had the gratuitous, you know, close up of them roaring and <laughs> other crap. Yeah, and it's nothing nightmares. Yeah, and even even in that, when I turned around and they were, and obviously at that point were moving towards us it's like you know before they're just kind of standing there and standing away but as soon as we start moving back down they it's like they started pursuing us so that's why i started walking back down the hill backwards you know looking over my shoulder every few few steps and turning back around because as long as i was facing that way they weren't moving yeah so i think whenever you would turn the other direction that's when they would start trying to gain on you yeah because I when when Jessica and Ben started moving at first, I the first five steps or so that I took, I was still facing that way. I think if so you would have broken around, ran for the car, they had that you would have you would have uh, you know uh, triggered a, a full on predator response. Well, and See, and what's that makes what's me think of more that, candid behavior. But what's funny about right. that is right before we went up that hill, you know, me and Jessica stopped being and saw, yeah, okay, look. This is serious. You have to understand all this stuff. And Jessica said, if Robbie or I want to tell you to go, she said, you need to go, but don't run. And he was like, why not? And I explained, the, you know, the predator prey, you know, the kicking in that 
run it. Oh, this must be food in uh, instinct. I said, you get just walk briskly, fast, but but do not break into a run. And it, so we had that discussion with him right before we went up there, and then we were all we were actually in that situation. So that's just that kind of blows your mind at that point. To think well, about that, that sounds more like canine behavior, though. You know, I'm thinking about yeah, agree like when I've been when I was, you know, a little more physically active and walking around in the parks and stuff like that. You know, when the dogs that follow me, I always noticed that they would gain ground when I would turn my back. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to run. Either way, it's scary as hell. You know, to to uh, channel our friend yeah. Doc, it's one of those things you're like, mm, time to go. Well, yeah. and that's that's pretty much what I I do, just go. Yeah, time, time to go. It's about half past time to get the hell out of here. But, you know, and like I said, it it spooked me. I mean, I, it didn't scare me, but it did. It definitely spooked me because that's I've had I've had a handful of encounters. And that's the first time that they've ever actually came toward me like that. And it was just it was just a, an unnerving feeling that, you know. They turn back around and then see that, and they're like, mm -hmm. "Yeah, it would have scared the hell out of me." To be honest with you. All right, boys, what y'all? What, what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. David reached out. He's like, you know, he helped me out with some clarification on something I said earlier. He goes, "Where's the dog?" Like he's right here. He's had his hair cut and he's ready for his public. <laughs> Ready for my close up, Mr. DeVille. Yeah, he's 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 been trimmed. He's got the he's the worm. <laughs> he can actually see now, so he's all excited about the show. <laughs> Kina loves his meetings. <laughs> he's been here since the show started, curled up a little ball behind me. He's like, I'm waiting for my close up. <laughs> Robbie. I wonder if it's not just a Missouri thing. Would you mind digging around in your area to see if there are any, you know, campgrounds that have been shut down, especially on man-made lakes, campgrounds that have been shut down without an explanation? Yeah, I don't mind that at all. I, I, I love doing stuff like that. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically I do might, some backwoods driving and I drive might some even, of these back uh, roads. I might even get Sonya to help me do some investigation on that. I know she's she's really into stuff in this area. So, what do you think, Sonya? Hey, if you, you find anything. It just it just proves credence and gives credence to this to what this theory. Yep. I know it's, you know, you would think a campground closure wouldn't attract a whole lot of attention. You know, it's not one of those things where you know there's this mass response right. you know, on the internet until you go down there to you know for your next year's vacation. Like, oh well, shit, it's closed. Right. Uh, but it's what like troubles me is ever since you're going to make a big ripple. All right, exactly. It's not one of these things that they've really hit my radar until we're sitting there talking about that going, why is the Corps of Engineers getting involved? Right. You know, it's like, well, the Corps of Engineers made the lake, but the Corps of Engineers that, owns why? those lakes. Well, you know, I'm, but the point is, just if I'm real estate, why do they care? If everything's above board, you would, you would think that the Army Corps of Engineers could only own the lake and the dam, that they couldn't own the property along the lake. Yet they do; they own a lot of it. I don't know. It's it's enough that it just doesn't make sense. And you know, we're talking Kimberly City here. We're talking prime real estate. You know, doctors and lawyers and all those people who have more cash than you and I do put together are building these lake houses and stuff. And this shit's off limits. Why? Yeah, and it's and then it's we're not talking economy. like you know four or five Why? acres. We're talking, but you know, the Joe Bald's probably in the ballpark of a hundred acres, probably. Right, but my point—I don't is, know the exact measurement of it because it's kind of sprawling around the shore of the lake, but it is not a small area. No, and you know, with real estate the way it is, I mean, my wife and I, you know, as we talked before, we don't we don't own a house, we rent. We're sitting looking at land in some of these little places that are nowhere near the lake. And they're looking at forty, sixty thousand dollars for you know an acre of land. Yeah, I mean, there's money here. I'm sorry. I mean, money talks. We're looking at a house. It, it was sense. out by Chadwick, Chadwick of all places. It was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm like Chadwick. Chadwick's in the ass crack of nowhere. It's next Seriously. to nothing. The only thing in Chadwick is a convenience yeah. store. That's it. Yeah. 
and they wanted that much for a house out there, and it wasn't even that great a house. The housing market's right. kind of out and out, kind of nuts right now. Oh yeah, we were looking at a place, and and uh, it, the uh, Rachel was like, "Oh, it's only like one hundred eighty thousand, whatever it was." I'm like, "Well, that's pretty cool," and we realized it was something out of a scene from Deliverance. I'm like, "Oh hell." <laughs> You know, the last house I bought was sitting on a half an acre, and I only paid one hundred and five thousand for it. <laughs> but that was twenty years ago. Steve, as long as you don't hear, as long as you don't hear, now, 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 you'll be fine. Don Donaldson said, "Hey, DA, I found Cow Creek Park on Table Rock Lake in Blue Eye. Um, Combs Ferry is just outside of Blue Eye. It's over near. Yep. So we got two two shut down campgrounds right there near Blue Eye, and Blue Eye ain't exactly civilization as most people know it." No. So we got two shut down campgrounds right there at Blue Eye. What the hell is going on in that area? And as as the crow flies like directly across the lake, it ain't that far from Joe Bald. It's a bit of a drive because mm -hmm. the road is windy as hell and you have to go back through the mountains to get over to Blue Eye. But if you just travel down the lake, it ain't that far. Well, and our our uh, our source that we were talking about that never materialized fully for us was talking about how at least or he could what he could tell that that was perfect uh, territory for where you know the uh, you know Bravo Foxtrot type characters like to hang out, and well, it was uh, in kind of a you know uh, mel, uh, what is the word I'm looking for kind of a, a zone where the the dogmen also like to interact. That encounter story that I uh, talked about on the show here a while back that I got from a guy that was retired from Missouri Department of Natural Resource, Resources was near Blue Eye. And that was that was a Bigfoot. Mm. I need to read that encounter again sometime. It's a pretty long one, but it's a good one. Uh, Qbot 111 says, Wildcat Creek Campground in Georgia is closed down. So do you any idea why? It's odd that they that they're shutting down these these campgrounds. It really is. Right. Well, what my it, source, it's not like uh, people aren't camping anymore. You go to any of the campgrounds that are still us, open uh, down at down at Lake Table Rock Lake, and they're always full. Yeah. What my source told us, uh, Brian, that we've talked about before, uh, DA, uh, was that at least the Bigfoot creatures tend to like the uh, like the the evergreen barrens, you know, the pine barrens, cedar barrens, things like that which they've got a lot of there off, off of Table Rock Lake. Um, I don't know enough about, you know, Georgia other than, you know, Spanish moss and things like that, what kind of plants they have. But I think they've There's got a lot of part of Georgia. Northern Georgia is a lot more timber. You've got mountains in northern Georgia. Sure. But I'm thinking, you know, if they like these, these, these uh, evergreen barren areas, it would stand to reason you see a few of those down there in, in Georgia. I mean, when I went down there, you know, just driving down to Fort Lauderdale, we saw a hell of a lot of uh, um, cypress trees and things like that. And, uh, you know, that things of that nature. Wyatt says, I got to looking into it. I don't think Cow Creek is shut down. My buddy just said it's creepy as hell. Well, if it's near Blue Eye, then that's a short, a very short boat ride over to Combs Ferry. So I might have to go down to Cow Creek and check that out. Yeah. Well, like I said, Look me up, DA. You know where to find me. Hell yeah. I got good insurance. <laughs> and I got plenty of ammo. There you go. And if we got nine mil, we can share ammo. We're good. Uh, Arkansas Hog Hunter. I believe it's Hog Hunter. Oh, sorry. I'm, Hog Hunter Dan says, yeah, DA, that's crazy. They shut down some of my stomping grounds. Not far from home either. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume by the, by the handle that you're, you're in Arkansas. Um, there's a lot of places in the Ozarks where these these things are easily, you know, easily find habitat. Um, if you're uh, Arkansas hog hunter, Dan, if you're familiar with uh, what is the name of that park? Um, War Eagle, War Eagle State Park in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It's not far from Eureka Springs. Um, had a sighting two people in broad daylight daylight on horseback mm -hmm. got chased out of war eagle by a creature they decided described as a bigfoot with a snout to me that sounds like a gugway gugway sounds like it to me too things that make you go yep time to get the hell out <laughs> kenai says nope <laughs> yeah. yep, it's like kenai's getting ready to unass the area he's heard enough yeah, for a gugway uh, kenai's just what do they call a horse dude yeah, or, 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 
Lord well, of the Rings. You know, he's 11 years old and he's pretty smart. So he's learned quite a lot and he knows that it's about time for him to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dogs, dogs with gimpy legs learn to unass the area quicker. Yeah. Don't you, buddy? Yeah. Don't you, bud? Now, Cora, on the other hand, might go after it full bore, but, you know. Allie's cat says she might Genosqua. actually be able to get away. Uh, Genosqua are nasty bastards, too. But yeah, you, I Genosqua, I don't think I've ever heard. Now, Ryan Paul, Ryan Paul Tremblay, who's a top-notch freaking researcher, one of the best that I know, he's in the chat. I don't know if he's still here. He would be the guy that could tell you if there's been any Genosqua sightings down this low in, in the in the in the UN, United States. Most of the Genos Genosqua sighting, uh, sightings that I can call to mind are either in Can Canada or right along the border. I yeah. don't think I I've ever heard of a Genosqua sighting this far south, but Ryan, Ryan would know more than me. All right, I have uh, not DA, pulled refresh, the, near refresh the my memory and for those of the uh uh, those of the gallery, uh, what's what's a Genosqua compared to the other? Genosquas uh, are, tend to be bigger, characters. more aggressive, and the, the, a lot of the natives referred to them as the stone giants because they had a habit of taking tree sap and matting it into their fur and then rolling in rivel gravel, uh, rolling in rivel gravel to make it stick to that so arrows and crap would bounce off. Uh, gotcha. You know, I don't know so if that's... So we're talking Gugway Light. light. For those of you at home, that's river gravel, not rivel gravel. gravel. That he said, <laughs> river gravel, river gravel. <laughs> Say that five times fast, but um, <laughs> river He's gravel. <laughs> but um, right. yeah, the that I don't know if that's a, something they still do because modern firearms wouldn't have too much trouble punching through river gravel. No, especially with some of these you know heavier ballistic calibers. You know, some of the shit that y'all like to carry. Well, I'm pretty sure my my uh, my M1 Garand's going to punch that. You know, there's something to be said about thirty out six. You know, 115 years of practice, they got it down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, I've been wanting to get one. Rounds, the, the wife informs eight, me that I have to uh, get a house before I can buy more guns. So I'm working. And if on eight it. rounds doesn't do it, and I hear that ping, I got plenty more loaded up. <laughs> Yep. If it's between my poor ass surviving or a little bit of Garantham, I would take the Garantham any day. Exactly. My thumb will heal. Seriously. Um, I know a good doctor that can drain a subungual hematoma in a thumbnail. So, you know, I got people. David Bice says, DA, I'll wait for the ping before I open up so you can reload. I won't need long. I won't need long at all. I've gotten pretty quick at shoving the, ne the next next clip in. Hey, and if I run out of ammo, I'm ready to go hand me, in hand. I got me one of them there bastards, too. We need to get Steve one. Ready to rock and roll. Yeah, seriously, Steve needs one. Steve's getting no love here. I'm just saying. We need to get get Steve hooked up with some uh, some scallywag gear. He, he's kind of, oh, yeah, he is kind of falling behind. He needs a Duclaw. I he am. needs a gunner's mate. And he needs a bounty. Cubot says we I'm have a bunch of wildlife anything. management areas that are closed until further notice. Cubot, it, what is that in Georgia? Was that was that was that what you were saying earlier, or what state are you in? Because wildlife management areas are something else that most people don't double check. And if they get shut down, there's never an explanation. It's like closed to hunting till further notice, and that's about all all you'll get. Yes, they said. I guess. Uh, there in Georgia. I, I have not thought of checking wildlife management areas around here to see if any of them have been shut. Folks, you know, this is this kind of conversation is 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 much needed in this field. It, with us just swapping ideas and talking about this, because I never would have thought of checking wildlife management areas. And it's only recently that I've I thought of, you know, I've come across these these similarities in, in campgrounds that are shut down. This is an entire area that I don't think has really been touched much in, by researchers. This, these are these could be prime, uh, prime real estate for where these things are living, and it's just it's being admitted under our nose. They're shutting these down for no reason, and not and you know not letting people have access to them anymore. That should be a huge red flag. Right, no public reason. And like I said, the thing that bothers me with uh, with Table Rock is the fact you're talking Kimberling City, one of the fastest growing real estate areas of Missouri. Why are you closing down prime real estate on the lake? 
when the reason makes no damn sense whatsoever. And you know, it's one of those things you're like, money talks, land is and you're like, Land is expensive on Table Rock. It's even more so up on Lake of the Ozarks now that they're building that massive resort up there. You can't touch land up there. You're lucky to be on a waiting list for property around Lake of the Ozarks right. now. Exactly. One of my doctor friends just bought a, a lake house out on the lake. He bought it from his dad. And the property alone, we're talking less than an acre, $500,000. Does not shock me. And that's why yeah, and like, these campgrounds okay, shut so down. Okay, so you got all this money. I'm like, why are we shutting this shit down? And you know, if you know, if, if that's what it's going for for a half acre, you know, why are they just without any explanation, you know, shutting these these parks down right here on the lake and then refusing to let anybody do anything with the land? Yeah, you know, it doesn't make sense because I mean, there are people like you and me who can't afford, you know. Uh, you know, one of these, you know, celebrity, you know, pads, but, you know, we could go in together, get a half an acre and put a tiny house on it that we could share, but we can't afford the land. You what? Can you do me a favor? You've mentioned some of these wildlife management areas and a couple of, a uh, couple of campgrounds. I just uh, put up the thing for our contact information. Could you shoot me an email with a list of the ones in your area? That way, if I get a chance to get out there where Robbie's at, cause he's not far from Georgia, we could probably drive down and check some of those places out. So, and I do plan on getting out that way, hopefully this year. Yep. You can just stop and pick me up and we can head on. I would go say, and, and Mandis will follow. I'm a little jealous. Randall, Randall Kildare says, I think there has to be a reason for this not pertaining to cryptid shenanigans. More likely it's banks and government colluding to reclaim everything on paper. If, if it was that, they would have done something with, with, those, with, that, with Joe Bald at the very least, because that is in prime right. real estate area, and it has set abandoned for 25 years. If there, were, if there was something to do with, with money, they would have done it by now. Yeah. Is it sure as heck ain't yep. making them money sitting there doing nothing? I can tell money you talks. from the time they closed it to now, the price of land on that lake has skyrocketed. When I first moved to to, to Springfield in ninety one, you could have bought a lake house on Table Rock with a little bit of land for sixty or seventy thousand dollars, and now you couldn't touch a shack for that. Mm. No, uh, you know, my, my buddy who just bought his, his little area, uh, he's got a, just about a half acre to three fourths of an acre, right, you know, right around that, that, that range, uh, just on the lake, nothing much you know, structural on it. You know, we're talking a half million dollars just for the land. I had a buddy that, uh, years ago had a trailer, like a, like a mobile home type trailer, not a, not a camper trailer. It was one of the small mm -hmm. ones, a little two bedroom mobile home that he bought from somebody right on table rock, looking down on the lake with, I think it had six or seven acres with it. And he bought it for like $25,000. And uh, the, he, eventually the trailer caught fire and burned down, but then he turned around and sold the land for like 140. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The, I mean, the price of land this far from the lake is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, I bought a place uh, in Nixa for about 105,000. Uh, that land just recently went for 180000 And my ex-in-laws put zero money into it. Absolutely none. We're talking about an old duplex built in the 80s that, you know, was probably barely up to code. You know, it's ridiculous. And that's still, you know, an hour from the lake. Yeah, Missouri, uh, the poll is coming up. Forgive me. Works. Missouri Broad says my husband's co-worker just had Thank a house you. built at the lake and it was eight hundred thousand without much land, all house. Not surprising. There you go. Not surprising at all. Yeah. Uh Qbot, my email just popped up. It's D A Roberts at D A Roberts dot net. Uh, or if you want to reach out to us, you know, via regular mail, it's P.O. Box forty six fourteen, Springfield, Missouri, six five eight oh eight dash forty six fourteen. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy stuff. And, uh, Oil Thorn it's says amazing. In, in Texas, Care Wildlife Management Area and the Richard Creek Wildlife Management Areas have been closed. 
Funny, though, they will both be back open Monday, the end of spring break. Hmm. I wonder why they want to keep teen partying teenagers out of there. <laughs> well, you and the Bigfoot's got to eat, too, man. Looks like me. Check the privilege. Than you, boys. <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I know he brought up a good point about, okay, could it be a land-grabbing scheme? Could it be something to do with repopulating wildlife? Yeah, it could, but it, there again, it, it, it's, it's always possible. Always, you've always got that linchpin of this of, okay, if it is, then why is it sat abandoned for 20 plus years? It's not yeah. doing it. And they were making money off of it as a park. Yeah. If they wanted to hold the, hold that land in, in, in uh, escrow and then sell it when, when the land prices skyrocketed, they could have done that and never closed the park and still been making money right. off that park the whole time. Yeah. Or even yeah. charge money for the campgrounds. You know, okay, you and I go That's to camp That's what I meant. The they, you know, you're paying for campsites. Yeah, I was going to say, so, you and I go to camp with the fam. You know, we pay 25 bucks for a weekend. That's 25 bucks that, you know, they got in their pocket. There's probably 70 to 80 campsites. And during the busy season, especially in the summer, campgrounds on the Table Rock Lake are full constantly. I mean, you've got a waiting list to get a campsite, uh, especially oh, the ones easily. close to Silver Dollar City. And that one's not far from Silver Dollar City. Uh, yeah. So, you know, seven, let's City say, especially. just for ease of math, let's say they had 100 campsites just to make it an even number. I don't think it's that many, but it could be. Um, at campsites ranging from anywhere but depending on whether or not well, well none of those those were all primitive so there's no electricity so a, average of ten dollars a night for, at a hundred dollars that's a what is that a thousand dollars a night they would have been making times 365 times you know 25 years how much money did they lose a lot yeah you're uh, conservatively you're talking a quarter million dollars a year conservatively you know, and, and it's probably more than that. I mean, uh, I, I dated a gal for a short period of time. He used to camp out of Kimberling City. And during the prime season, they were paying 60 to $80 a night for campgrounds. And we're talking yeah. to campgrounds where they brought their fifth wheel down. They ran off of propane, you know, primitive camping, as you as you say. Glamping. You know, <laughs> well, what did you say? Glamping. You know, Glamping. There you go. You, there are, there are, are times you can stay cheaper in a hotel than you can at a campground. Depending on the campground. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on where it's if at. You want, if you want to stay in Silver Dollar City's campground, it has shuttle service directly to the park and all that access to Branson, be, be prepared to pay because it is not cheap. Yep. And most of those are just primitive campsites. They do have electrical hookups, but they're first come, first served. Right. And and they're, they're too prom janky as shit <laughs> when you try to come to them, too. Yeah. It ain't exactly the greatest of campgrounds. Uh, that no. whole area behind Silver Dollar City all the way down to Indian Point is always booked solid. Mm -hmm. Well, you know there's money moved around down there. You know, When I was camping down in Kimberling City at one of the cottages, uh, my wife put me up down there for a little bit of R&R. &R, and like, we were right next to a resort. And like just to pick up you know, food truck food, you know, we're talking 30 bucks. You mm -hmm. know, it was, it, was not, it was not camping on the cheap you know, so to speak. And, Allie's uh, cat says, I wonder yeah. if the government gets tax back on that type of land. No, they're not getting any tax revenue off that land because it all belongs to the army Corps of engineers. It all belongs to the government. How convenient. How convenient. And he disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Poof. We lost the man down, man down. So what do you think the odds of wildlife oh, management areas and campgrounds in your area are shut down, Robbie? Let me see if I can call Steve back. <laughs> Didn't only works on Doc and he's I, not here tonight. Only works on Doc. But I I was sitting there trying to think about the campsites that I know of around here and I can't think of any of them that I know of that that I've heard that are closed but there was a lot well, of not, 
it's not like any of these that were advertised they were closed. They right. just kind of stumbled across finding out that they're closed. But what I was, was going to say is there was a lot of primitive campsites up on Joe Cassie and around Joe Cassie Gorge. And there is a lot of sightings up, up there. My uncle used to go up there. He's he's big in the, uh, in the cryptic stuff. He used to go up there and camp a lot. It seemed like I heard from somebody somewhere that they are not allowing – in primitive camping up there anymore. I I I need now that we've had this discussion. I need to find out if that's true. I've been up there before. I actually had an encounter up there. That you remember the one I told you about when me and uh, me, my dad, Kevin, and my uncle all went up there, and my dad and Kevin went on walking, and me and my uncle kind of this is the same uncle. We kind of stopped and kind of crouched down on that little rock face, and something was throwing acorns or whatever down. It wasn't falling off a cliff because it was being pitched over that same area so i need to check and find out if if that is uh closed down because there's a lot of stuff and that actually connects to the area that uh me and johnny go to uh that we had our old found the footprint and all that stuff in it all connects to that that's a trailhead though where me and johnny go is a trailhead for joe cassie gorge no i just had the weirdest sensation gentlemen i stepped away to empty my middle-aged bladder and somebody must have opened a bottle of whiskey or something. I felt this like pull tugging it me back worked. into reality. You know, it's like all of a sudden my hair is just like something's pulling. It was me. just a delayed reaction. It just works quicker must on have whiskey. Must have been whiskey. Karen, Karen yeah, Poland says our local go campgrounds that are gone is because now there are houses there, which would make sense to close, not build. Doesn't exactly right. I mean, you know, if they're going to close a campground right. down and parcel out the land to build houses on, that would make sense. But to shut it down and just leave it to set fallow makes no sense. Look, uh, Sonia said, yeah, it's yes, it's true. So Sonia, are you saying, yes, it's true. They have stopped primitive camping up at Joe Cassie. Cause that's what I heard. And I know there is a buttload of sightings up there. Casey Calloway says, could the government be using these places for nefarious programs? Yeah. Well, it's funny you should say that because Joe Bald, every one of those campgrounds, every one of those, because I've camped, I camped there before when it was open. Every one of them are primitive campsites. There's no place to plug in an RV. There are hooks where you can hang your lanterns, but there are no electrical hookups anywhere in the park. Yet, uh -huh. Robbie and I, uh -huh, Robbie and I found two massive, and I don't mean like where you could plug in a lantern and charge it or plug your phone in. And this would have been 1996, seven when when that was open, when the park was open. We found two very large steel electrical boxes with power cables running into the ground and not running anywhere else. Yeah, well, and I see a picture of that not. one that you and Robbie found to my ex father in law. And he said it was 443 phase. I'm going to tell so It's way more powerful than you need for a, a camper. In, unless they're running a fucking McDonald's down there, it doesn't make any sense. What, so, what, need, what needed that much power in a, camp, in a primitive campground with no power running to it? Nothing I own. And hell, you I could. Well, I know Missouri's a cave state. I wonder if there's a cave under Joe Bald. I really do. Well, did, didn't Jessica say she. Uh, she found or viewed something underground or she read something. She believed that, that she believed there that there was something underneath Joe Bald. And Zanya just uh, confirmed it. Yes. Joe Cassie, there is no more primitive camping up there. So that's been shut down. And Joe Cassie is a very big man-made lake. And it's probably along those same parameters as, uh, as uh, Joe Bald. Well, when Kennedy took, took office, he empowered, state governments all across the country to start building hydroelectric dams. Um, well, th that's where, that's where the LBL came from. It wasn't until 1963 when those two dams were built on uh, the Kentucky river. And I can't remember the name of the other river. Um, but uh, those two, those two lakes didn't exist prior to 1963. Uh, a lot of a lot of lakes around around the around the U.S. Uh, were built because of the initiative to build hydroelectric dams to help you know power a growing population. Uh, Lake of the Ozarks is a lot older. Lake of the Ozarks was built in the 1930s. Uh, that dam has been there for a long time. My grandfather helped build that dam. Uh, it's called Bagnell Dam. 
Now, it's been there mm -hmm. been there a while, but a lot of these well, lakes in Missouri aren't that old. I don't think Truman's that old. I don't think Stockton's that old. There's yeah. actually some some LBL type uh, stuff tied to Joe Cassie Lake that we're talking about because I've, I've heard this two ways. My uncle, my mom's brother, he used to be a, a certified dive instructor, and he would take classes up to Joe Cassie to uh, to do their open water certification because this is a huge lake. There is basically a city underground up there. Now, some people say that they just, and Sonia, if you know anything about this too, you, you chime in since you're from Pickens too. And some people say that they just put that stuff in there just for dive classes, just to give it, give it something. But I've also heard on the flip side that it actually was a town that kind of like the LBL type stuff that just got flooded because they were like. There's several Ooh. towns at the bottom of Lake of the yeah. Ozarks. And my uncle's six five. This is the one that, that the same one from from my first Bigfoot sighting. Big guy. He said he stopped uh, te uh, teaching classes up there because one time he saw he looked down and saw a catfish bigger than him up in that lake. I've heard that story about a lot yeah. of dams that the catfish will continue to grow as long as they live, but, as long as they get what, food. Yeah. Well, what food do they eat? Coming out of that dam, that's causing them to grow that big. I've personally been camp, been uh, diving down at Table Rock Lake at Bagel Dam, and I've seen a catfish that I would estimate 120 pounds. They it get scared big. the ever-living hell out of me because I thought it was a shark. David Bice says and, Springfield Underground used to be like that. I worked security down in Springfield Underground. I could tell you some stories about that place. Uh, and Casey Calloway says, DA, have there ever been any seismic studies done around there? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, we're so close to the New Madrid fault line. I'm sure seismic studies have been done all over this area, uh, but I've never seen one. However, I can tell you that area is riddled with caves. In fact, uh, as the crow flies from Joe Bald is just a few miles away is, is a uh, silver dollar city with Marvel cave. One of the largest caves in the state of Missouri. Right. Uh, one of those caves where you were told not to go after night, no matter what you hear. Right. right? Look, look what Sonny just said about Joe Cassie. Uh, Roxanne says, DA Big Bay Campground on Table Rock Lake is near Shell Knob is closed. Didn't know that. I'm going to add that one to the list. Look what Sonny just said. And what was the other about, one? I got, it's up there. Uh, you just oh, said okay. about them. Pull it. Where did it go? It's on there. It says, my. <laughs> Somebody hit it. I had it, it on skipped. there. Oh. I got it. All right. So it's my daddy is in the book at four years old and his family at four years old in the town. They flooded the valley, took the land, and didn't move anything. That's what happened at, at uh, Lake of the Ozarks. The, the town of Lynn Creek, Missouri, is under the water. And there's still stories from locals that say at certain times of the year, you can see the lights of, Lynn, of old Lynn Creek. Down in the down in the depths, uh, Lynn Creek, Missouri, is still a town. They, you know, the residents moved and started another town, but the original town, including farming equipment, a church, a school, and numerous buildings, are still there. And my uncle Owen, before mm -hmm. he passed away, he told me that he was out there one time fishing, didn't realize where he was at, and kept kept trying to figure out why he was hearing music that sounded like it was coming from the water. Oh, that's creepy as hell. Mm -hmm. So when he realized where he was at, he's like, I think I'm just going to go back to the other side of the lake now. I want to go back up to Joe Cassie now. Because that ain't far right down. Roxanne, you're from, you're from this area. Uh, if you know of any others besides Big Bay, uh, shoot them to me in an email. I would really appreciate it. Or shoot them to me in a message on Facebook. That's fine, too. Uh, I need to write down Big Bay before I forget it, though. I'll have to do a little research and find where it's at. And catch the like channel. An Thank you so much. Big Bay Campground. Table Rock Lake. Got it written down in my little notebook. We might be on to something here. 
enough to make sure we've opened a can of worms that we was previously unthought of wildlife management areas and campgrounds all shut down without explanation. There's gotta be a reason, especially since these areas are prime habitat. Well, and the government does nothing without a reason. Right. I mean, it may not always be clear to us, but I mean, they're, they're out to make money and everything has a reason. Well, you and I both and know the fact, Steve, that Kimberling City tried to reopen Joe Bald several times, and they've been shut down every time by the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah. At the 11th hour, the Corps of Engineers comes in, which is what Brian said, and he volunteered that. It, you know, it wasn't like I was hitting with some of my, you know, a DA verse, you know, you know, Mojo. boogie boogie. <laughs> yeah, Mojo, there we go. And he came out of that, yeah, out of the up on top of his head. I was like, hmm, interesting. Roxanne says, DA, they say at Big Bay, the facilities are not up to date for all the new techs. You know, they don't need to be. I mean, it's a campground. People aren't expecting to have Wi Fi and, and hot and cold running water. Camping. Right. A primitive campground, you just listed as primitive camping, and it is what it is. Yeah. If, you, if you need it, you pack it in. Yeah, seriously. You bring a Coleman like, lantern and shit in the hole. That's what you do. That's like a vehicle sold as is, no warranty. You get what you right. get. You got it. Primitive, primitive campsite. That's what it is. It's a place for you to put a tent down or pull a pop-up camper or maybe big enough to to pull a, uh, a fifth wheel or something like that in, but it's not. Don Combs says, sounds like a good plot for a book, cough, cough. Well, I, I did mention a lot was. about Joe Bald in, in the Lakeview Man series. <laughs> Just don't let Steve die, okay? Steve's had a rough go. <laughs> we got to keep Steve around. <laughs> yeah, Mike Evans is already out to get me. <laughs> Speaking of Mike, I need to get a hold of him and see if he wants to come back on the show. Yeah. Um, so the the inside joke is that 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 this Steve is collecting uh, walk on deaths in other writers' books. You know, so far DA has been very kind and hasn't killed me yet. But it's uh, early. Yeah, I recently I recently run a contest with another writer who is a friend of the channel. And uh, my my win in the contest was to have a walk on death horribly. <laughs> so we'll Philip see how Crowell. that goes. Philip Crowell says underwater ghost towns of the Blue Ridge lakes list: Fontana Lake, Lake Burton, Lake Lake Jocassi, Jocassi, Summersville yes, Lake, awesome. Smith Mountain Lake, Teleco, and Calderwood Lakes. That right there, you know that that that's that's a ton of of areas to research. You know, they they flooded these towns. Not only we're we going to get a lot of paranormal activity over that, but there's got to be a reason they were willing to flood out entire towns. Yeah, land sells. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's water. funny that they went to the on Lake Jocassi. I think it's funny that they went to the to the lengths of spreading. Oh, we just we put that stuff down there to for for dive schools. That they they went to the to the links of spreading rumors like that, right? Why? Well, you know, and it, dives are expensive, but there's no way the dive classes outweigh the amount of money you get from just primitive campers. I'm sorry. Dash fifty two fifty seven says there's a bridge submerged over by the Kimberling Bridge. Yeah, the original bridge that went across that that river is underwater right next to the Kimberling City Bridge, and there's another one here in Missouri somewhere that's like that, and it's not the Kimberling City Bridge. God, I wish I could remember remember which one it is. It's a much smaller bridge right next to an, a more modern bridge that's now underwater. It's somewhere here in Missouri. I, I'm, I'm sure I'll think of it at some point. Um, Casey Calloway says, you've ever heard of Ralph's hole? He found a hole on his property that he couldn't find a bottom. The government showed up and seized his land. That's what happened to the Smittle family. The, the Missouri Department of Conservation seized their land. They fought it. But if you read it on read on their on the on the website, you know, the the version of the story told by the Department of Missouri Department of Conservation is that the Smittles, out of the goodness of their heart, donated that land. And they fought them tooth and nail because that was generations of their family was lived on that farm. And you know, and the Smittles well, did not donate that land. That's the same thing as the guy who found the uh the chunk of gold the size of a softball on his property 
and the government come in and taxed him on it. Of course they did. Explain that to me. Now, I just dug this piece of gold up on my property. Uh, all right, well, you owe us taxes on it. Yeah. What? I didn't see you out here with a backhoe. No kidding. Yeah, I don't remember the government being around when I earned all that money, but now they want their piece of it. Yep. That sounds about right. Well, what do we uh, say? Philip Croyle says the, un the submerged towns of America on Uncharted 101 website gives a short list of some by state. I will have to check that out. Thank you for pointing that out. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Boys, I think we've got got our work cut out for us just on research alone, looking into some Seriously. of these, see how many of these wildlife management and 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 uh, uh, primitive campsites are just shut down without explanation. It's been very productive for sure. Nicola says that's why you keep your mouth shut if you find things. You bet your ass if I found a chunk of gold the size of a freaking softball, I ain't telling nobody, but maybe you like just these guys. <laughs> I'm not going to brag about it on the show. I'm just going to slowly, you know, sell it off a piece at a time and uh, put that money in the bank. Hell, I might not even do that. I might put that in the first natural, first national master mattress of my back bedroom. So to speak. Yep. I don't actually Probably put money in a mattress. Really That's the, the old joke. <laughs> Something about a 2,000 acre ranch in the middle of Montana somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I always said if I won the lottery and won a lot of money, I was going to buy as much land as I could buy in the in the woods, either Montana or Wyoming or maybe even in the Mark Twain if I could buy it. But buy as much land as I could buy and then build a house right smack in the middle of it so I don't have any neighbors anywhere near me. And then hire your favorite bartender as a nurse, right? There you go. Absolutely. We'd have, <laughs> a, we'd have us a compound. We would. Head of security? Seriously. Yeah, I was going to say, be, the, we'd be, be so far off the grid. The only people alcohol. that remember we existed to be the tax bartender, people. head of security, and whenever, wherever little man's at tonight, personal medic. Mm -hmm. We all got our roles to play, and uh, and then the the official cook. We all got our roles uh, to play. Yeah. Dash 5257 says, over where I used to live was a big square opening about 10 foot by 10 foot. It looked like a mine shaft, and it was always full of water. I think it was lake water. Hmm. It sounds almost like that uh, that place on, um, oh, what the hell's the name of it? Oak Island. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yep. we got the, the flooded shaft. Casey Calloway, you are absolutely correct. But, you know, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. If the Army Corps of Engineers owns all this land and these wildlife management areas are owned by probably the state departments that manage, you know, manage wildlife or even federal, it makes perfect sense that the government would shut these things down and not give us an explanation, especially if they're not developing these areas and just letting them go fallow. There's a reason they're shutting them down. And I don't buy for a second that it's because they're waiting for the land prices to go up so they could sell it off. If that was the case, the Army Corps of Engineers would have been making, because I know for two, two campgrounds right now that are both large campgrounds that they shut down on Table Rock Lake that, they could have made money off of as a campground for years before then they just up and sold the land. And they, instead of letting those, those parks set empty for decades, uh, Combs Ferry over by Blue Eye is the other one. And Combs Ferry actually had a marina there, not just, you know, not just a, a camp primitive campground. It had a functioning marina with docking slips for, you know, like 20, 30 boats. So, you know, that place was making money. Mm-hmm. David Bice says, DA, if I hit one of those jackpots, there'll be a compound. Well, you just let me know, brother. If you need a fat rider, I'm your guy. <laughs> Armorer for hire. There we go. Dash 5257 says, I remember that marina. It was a nice marina. I mean, it was a good-sized marina. Uh, so why would they basically 
strike that marina, shut the camp gun, and then shut it down to the point they literally bulldozed it off. Um, right. There's a public fishing access point right close to the park, but they even close that at dusk. They will come in, kick you out, and lock the gate. So you can't get out on that peninsula at all after dusk. And that's worse than Joe Bald. Joe Bald, you can at least drive in there. They might come in there. Right. You know, Stone County might come in and tell you to get out, but you can drive in there. You know, twenty four seven, and you just may not be allowed to stay. Well, Combs right. Ferry after dusk, you can't get in there at all. Well, I said Joe Bald, you can at least catfish until they chase you out. Right, and I, I, I'm pretty sure if you were fishing, they'd probably ignore you. But if we were down there setting up cameras and shit, I guarantee the 24 hour 24 hour maintenance vans are going to show up and pretty soon we're going to be asked to leave. Yep. Casey Calloway says, Robbie, can I be part of the security team? <laughs> I have a, a open tryouts in, interviews, <laughs> interviews, tryouts. not tryouts, interviews. <laughs> Good thing tryouts. it works, Steve. Like Sorry. Works. That's okay. I like the way that works. Turn well, you, hey, hey, we gotta see how we gotta see how you handle a firearm. So it kind of could be a tryout too. Who knows? Seriously, I mean, if you can't use a Cat Seven and you can't shoot, what the hell good are you? I mean, you know. I mean, DA would be happy if I could make it a good old fashioned, but you know, I'd like to be able to shoot and stop a bleed if I could do it. Speaking of old fashions. Um, Annette and I went to a bar down in uh, Durant, Oklahoma. Um, well, actually, we were at the casino, and I went to the bar. She was playing. She was playing playing slot machines. Um, but had the bartender make an old fashioned, and it was damned good. He he made a smoked old fashioned, but he did something that I have never ne had never heard of before. He used two types of bitters. He used orange bitters and black walnut bitters. Really? And it was the best old fashioned I think I've ever had. It was fantastic. But the mm. stupid thing about that bar is, and granted, I, I know my family's all Scotch Irish, so I've got a genetic predisposition, but every old fashioned you order is automatically a double, and they limit you to two an hour. And I killed two in like 20 minutes. He's like, dude, I can see you're perfectly fine, but the casino rules are I cannot sell you more than two of these in an hour because they're doubles. I'm like, shit, do I need a stopwatch to come back and get another one? Well, sounds like Steve's Puppet Grub. Every drink there is a double, you know? Damn right. So we've got to get some black walnut bitters and a, and a smoker, a drink smoker. Sounds like a plan. I say I usually use uh, Angostura orange bitters. Or at least that's mm -hmm. what's used in the South Boston and uh, Steve's Old Fashions. But uh, I'm intrigued. I want to try it. Uh, Qbot says we had a Jellystone Park close to High Falls State Park in Georgia. The state bought it and closed it down. Went by there, and they have bulldozed it and a lot of land owned by the state park. The state park absorbed it, basically. Hmm. Mrs. Moon says, my folks' favorite drink was Old Fashions. I'm a connoisseur of Old Fashions. Uh, you can ask Steve. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very critical judge of a bar by their Old Fashioned. And uh, Steve and I have been to a few places where the Old Fashions were quite good. And then we, we've had a couple others where we looked at each other like, what the fuck is this? Right. If, if you want to find out how good a bar is, order an Old Fashioned or Manhattan. Uh, both of those are 100-year-old cocktails. If the bartender can't make it, drink somewhere else and uh we like you said we found a few that were like definitely we found a few that were like mm, no right yeah I, so know, I, I would I'm, like to I'm, I'm a bit of a snob good old -fashioned. i'm a bit of a snob i drop I, dr I judge my bars by old fashions and i judge my barbecue places by their beans and if they don't have good barbecue beans i don't like the place Yep. If, uh, my personal rule of thumb, since I'm drinking as many old fashions because of the sugar, but if I walk into a bar and they can't make it old fashioned or they give me this look when I order one, I just walk back out. <laughs> Not a point in staying. Well, Patty says, question, just curious. I can shoot a crossbow. Is it harder to shoot a gun? But guns scare me. Robbie, what do you think? Do you think it's harder to shoot a crossbow than a gun? I don't think it's harder to shoot. But I think it's hard. Well, certainly to be, less noise. 
Yeah, but I think it's uh, harder to be accurate with a crossbow than it is with a with a not to gun. not to mention with a crossbow, you don't get near the the range that you're going to get with a with a good rifle. Uh, if the boom yeah. is what bothers you, you know you can condition yourself to get used to it, or you can just you know pay the tax stamp and get a suppressor. Uh, but either way, I would given the given the op uh, opportunities available, I would rather have a, a rifle uh, than a crossbow. One because it's so much easier to load one, and two the range factor, and the simple fact that once you fire a crossbow, you got to go through a arduous process to reload it. Most of the time, it's one shot at a time. So if you're in a serious situation. You better hope you're a real good shot. Folks, uh, those of you who are, who are uh, listening to the show, uh, we have noticed a trend with the, uh, the not demographics, what's the word I'm looking for? Analytics. Analytics. The channel analytics that we're pretty close to right at half of the people that watch the show are not subscribed to the channel. Uh, so if you're checking out the show, if, you, if you've listened to the show more than once, we would love it for you to hit a subscribe to the channel. It's free, folks. It doesn't cost you a cent to subscribe to a channel on YouTube. It does help our demographics and helps us to continue to reach more people. Um, if you want to join the channel, you can do so as a paid member, but you don't have to. You can just subscribe to the channel and, again, doesn't cost you a thing. Uh, so make sure you hit that like and subscribe and hit that little bell icon so you get notified anytime we go live. Uh, we would certainly appreciate the uh, the love and the support. And again, it does help us reach a larger audience. I'm a little concerned, Dee. I just popped open this top of this whiskey. And not only did Doc, Doc not show up, but it shows zero people watching the show right now. Uh, well, I'm showing 161. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, sh I show 157 on YouTube, but my counter on the actual stream lab shows zero. That's weird. It saddens me. Well, you know, the, you, you got, if you uh, count on technology to tell you the truth, you might just be surprised. Um, <laughs> since uh, we are now at the top of the two hour mark, which is surprising because it really has gone by pretty fast. How about we hear a little word from our uh, little feller, old Doc himself? A little about word from little Doc. A little word from the little guy. A little uh, message from Dark Angel Medical. Hey, everybody. This is Carrie Pocket Doc Davis from Dark Angel Medical, and you are listening to DAX Machina with DA Roberts. You may recognize me or some of my products from Dark Angel Medical in some of the Apex Predator, Lakeview Man, and Wild Hunt books. And you can get those products at www.darkangelmedical.com along with training classes on how to use those products and save a life. Shoot us an email at info at darkangelmedical.com and be the difference. And remember, Doc's kits and classes are HSA and FSA certified. Uh, so you can, if you've got, you know, you've got that in your department, you can get the kits and the classes for, for the cost of your HSA. Uh, remember to check out Dark Angel Medical and use discount code CRYPTID25 for 25% off your order. And if you mention Team Odin or code name Wild Hunt in the comments, you'll get a little Team Odin rocker that goes on the Velcro on your kit. So definitely check them out. I can't recommend them enough. Uh, it's the kit I carried the whole time I was a cop, and um, yeah, I can't. I, 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 there's no other kit I would trust my life to. Uh, yeah. Birthdays and back never had packages the, right there. The honor of serving, but this little rocker is badass. I'll be honest with you. And uh, it's like that, only small. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's a little go. smaller than that one. Uh, I will say but, uh, that uh, you, you know those those kits are great. You know, as DA says before, you know, if if you uh, need a kit and don't have it, you'll never need it again. And uh, they've got their kid for life guarantee. So if you ever use your kit to save a life, tell the story or know about it, or replace what you used. I mean, that's a that's a guarantee like you can't believe. And uh, and as Robbie could testify, there's the classes. My God, you know what's the point of having this kid? You don't know how to use it. And uh, I mean, I'm a registered nurse who've taken several trauma classes. I still don't feel like I've learned what Doc teaches at one of his. So it's worth looking into, guys. Definitely. That and, and you know, if you're interested in snowmobile sodomy, you know, read some of these books, you'll find <laughs> out all about it. 
<laughs> and he, he really makes the class fun. I mean, I've been in classes with people who knew everything they needed to know about the topic. And the classes were just so freaking boring because they, they weren't passionate, didn't know what they didn't know how to teach. Doc's passionate, knows how to teach, and knows everything he needs to know about the class. It, and I went in scared. I, I told Doc several times, oh, dude, I don't know if I can. He's like, don't worry, I got you. You good. And he's right. <laughs> It was a it was a great class. I'm glad I I'm glad I went. And you can get well, a lot of those classes, a lot of the uh, the the early development classes on Dark Angel Medical's YouTube channel for free. So, but the advanced classes you'll have to take in person. Uh, check darkangelmedical.com for listings of classes in your area. Uh, Robbie, you want to tell us a little bit about Scalawag Tactical? Why? Well, I, like <laughs> I would love to. It's a word. Um, yeah, the S word, as we talked about earlier. Um, Scallywag is another one of our affiliates, veteran-owned company. Uh, Craig and his crew out at Scallywag. Uh, some of the best-made blades you can get your hands on. You know, I say this all the time. They are the kind of people who make you a customer, not a number. And they do what they can to make you a customer for life. Case in point with Steve. Mm -hmm. you know, I I love to hear Steve tell that story of of how that how they made him a customer for life because that's what they do to everybody. You know they truthfully they sent uh when I bought my Karambit, I think I got a uh, email wanting me to uh give a little testimony about it. So I said I did my little testimony and did my little write in and said, you know, that, Hey, this is like my seventh or eighth, whatever it was blade. Glad. I'm so glad I found this. I'm actually the one that does the, the spiel for y'all on DAX Machina. And Craig personally sent me an email back thanking me for, for what we say and what we do on the show. But he didn't have to do that. I mean, honestly, he no. did not have to reply to that because it was a survey. It was a, it was a, Hey, how did you like your blade? Yeah. And this is a this Crazy is a damn good, good one to have in your tackle box. The bad fish. The bad fish. Yeah. You're I don't have some of the cool blades that, that the, uh, the other two gentlemen have. I, I would love to have a bounty. You know, every time you know one of them whips out the bounty, I'm like my, my tongue hits the floor because I'm a little jealous. Yep. But uh yeah, a few years ago I bought a privateer and I'm like, yo, this is a pretty good folder. I'm a I'm a badass. I like this knife. And then I tried to pry open, a, of all things, a stapler, and I broke the tip off of it. And I felt like a complete moron. I had the knife like a week. And I emailed uh, Craig, and, you know, he's, there you go. And he's like, uh, well, clearly you've never had a good knife. Well, what I didn't realize at the time is that D2 die steel, the reason it holds an edge as well as it does, is that it is very, very hard. It very hard means very brittle. And I broke the tip off it because I used the knife in, inappropriately. And he could have just kind of done a little, you know, eh -eh, buy another one. Uh, but instead, he's like, okay, first of all, don't do that again. Second of all, send the knife to us. We'll put a new edge on it. Be good as new. You got this. I sent it to him. I got it back in like three days. It was slightly shorter because he put a new edge on it. it. Looks great. Works great. Customer for life. Just saying, you know. And uh, I went ahead. I was so impressed. I bought another one for my brother-in-law. Bought him a, a new one. He said it's the best knife he's ever carried. And this dude's collected, you know, all the, all the big name knives, you know, the, the Kershaw's and the, and the, uh, help me Robbie here. Give me some other names here. Some of these Buck. Kershaw, these Strade, Spiderco, Gerber, uh, CRKT, uh, Old Timer, Case. There, there you mean, go. Well, you know, my brother-in-law, he's, he's carried all the big ones and he said it's the best he's ever carried. He has yet to sharpen it. I gave it to him a year ago. You know, customer for life. Never met Craig. Probably never will meet Craig. He's got a customer for life because he took the time to explain to me what I did wrong, educate me on it, and he stood by his product. It was always. Yep. And, you know, it's, I can't say this enough. Is if you, if you value a good blade all the way around from everything from 
what you carry it in, how it, how you attach it to what you're going to carry it, or how, however you're going to carry it, the blade, the what kind of condition. The sheaths on these knives are high quality Kydex. Oh, yeah. And I love the, the locking mechanisms on them because I've had those that just got, just got the little U that kind of folds up in it and they all the time fall back open. But the way that the lock, I'm talking about the, uh, what locks it on your belt. It's got to put, mm -hmm. you got to push it in and slide it. So it's not going to just come open. Here's the, the locking mechanism. Hit the button and open it. You close it on your belt and then slide this over and it locks in place. It will not, won't pop back open. That is a pretty, not, I mean, it, it, anybody's ever wore something, a Kydex sheet that, and I don't I don't have I got one like that, but it basically it's just a little it's just a little U shape that folds over and locks in. Those things will get loosened up and they'll fall and your knife sheath will come open. That's a pain in the butt. Especially when you walk through the woods and you look down and your knife is gone because it was on your belt. Now it ain't because that that little locks come open. Um but go check them out. Uh scallywagtactical.com. Check out the the uh, blemish blade section. I think they still got a few left in that one. They're getting ready to, they're trying to move some inventory because they've got 26. Is that right, DA? I think it is. 20, I think it's 24, 24 new knives. Is the, 24 new blades year. coming in. Uh, they've already got some of them up on the website, the Mantis and one or two others maybe. Um, pretty cool little knife and supposedly some other cool stuff coming in. So go, go check them out. Hit the blemish blade section. Whatever you get, get the, uh, check out, put in code DA Roberts 10, get yourself an extra 10%. And that, that stacks up on any sales or any blemish blade sale, anything that, that they got, even the Scally swag, which they've got, they don't sell just blades. Yeah, pirate flags back in, back in stock. And they, Ooh, and they're, yeah, they're on a good price right now too. Yep. Go check it out. I mean, Craig's a great dude. Like we said, tell him we sent you. Um, he'll take care of you. And he'll make you a customer for life. And that's all Definitely. I got to say about that. That's all I got about that. Steve, you want to tell us a little bit about Brock Blades? Oh, sure. Well, since he's not here to defend himself, you know, Ken Brock is uh, always one of those gentlemen that's very quick to bust our balls, and rightfully so. But we love him to death. You know, we, we talk the many, uh, many uh, benefits of Scallywag Tactical. Scallywag Tactical are amazing knives. They're not cheap knives because they're not cheap knives, just like Doc's products there at, at uh, Dark Angel Medical. The difference between his blades and the ones you get at Scallywag is Scallywags are mass produced. If you buy a privateer today, it's going to be the same as the privateer that Robbie buys tomorrow and the privateer that, that Doug or a DA buys next month. They are mass produced. They're amazing, but they're mass produced. Everything you get from Brock Blades is a one of a kind work of art. They're hand made by Ken Brock. Uh, and you know, no two will be the same. You get a, get a street weasel from him, you know, today it'll be a little bit different, very slightly different than the street weasel you get six months from now, otherwise known as the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, Doc Davis, uh, you know, Claymore. Um, but, uh, Ken's got some good stuff. Uh, it's all good. You know, it, it's good resources, good, uh, uh, good base materials and a lot of expert work put into it. Uh, everything is a work of art. You get a knife and you get a piece of art all at once. And uh, it'll hold up to whatever you need it to do, but it is it is nice. And uh, it's got some good stuff. It's it's all made uh, direct. Uh, if you buy something from his website, you get a discount uh, using uh, the code CRYPTID10 in your order for $10 or 10% 10 off. Uh, if you have him custom make something for you, um, just let him know that DA sent you. And you still get the same discount, and uh, it is some good stuff. Uh, you know, every every product, like I said, it's a work of art. It's worth every penny you put on it, and it's fun to have Ken come on and bust our balls every once in a while. Friend of the channel. <laughs> and that's all he got to say about that. That's exactly. all I got to say about that. Since the tactical midge is not here to defend himself, you know, I'll, I'll be nice to him. A little fun in that. <laughs> no 
I thought I'd try it once in a while, you know. Lisa Doesn't Smith need... says, D.A., if you need a mortician in your new comp, com, uh, compound, I have 25 years' experience. Well, hopefully we won't need a mortician anytime soon, but you never know. I hope That's not. That's not a position I want to do. That's not a position I, I want to be on board for. To uh, witness a, uh, an autopsy about a month ago, and it was the coolest thing ever. Now, I will admit I'm a nurse. I'm a little weird, but, you know, God bless you for what you do, and, you know, I'm about some cool stuff. About I've witnessed quite a few autopsies in my law enforcement career, and how you just chose to describe it is not how I would choose to describe it. No, mm. no, you're you're like a brother to me, Robbie. But I can tell you, I ain't right, and you know that. You know. Oh, well, I know that, but I just I ain't either. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but <laughs> I just, it's, there's something weird about, it, and most of the guys that I've seen do those, they're really not right. No, no, they're not. And, uh, just, you know, my, my wife, God, God love her. Uh, she is, uh, you know, she was pre-med before she was a, a math teacher and she's got an interest in the healthcare stuff. And you know, probably would have been a doctor if, if the universe aligned properly. I'm sitting there telling her stories about my, my autopsy. She's like, that's cool. We're like discussing over dinner. I'm like, yep, that's why I married you. <laughs> that's to envision Mel Brooks and they're trying to make everybody throw up from Dracula dead and loving it. No kidding. Seriously. Well, I, I will say that the real Rachel's is badass is the, is the one that runs a pub and grub, I'll be honest. Boys, we are after the two hour mark. Uh one the other thing uh, one of the things I always want to make sure I mention is the twenty two a day foundation. We lose twenty two veterans a day to suicide. Uh and groups like the Valhalla Project, till Valhalla.com uh are big supporters of the 22 a day foundation. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud to, to support the till Valhalla project. In fact, I will throw their website up. Um, there we go. Check out till Valhalla project. They've got some amazing t-shirts. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's where I bought this one it says embrace the suck on it. Um, they've got all kinds of veterans, veteran wear. Uh, and they, they're one of those. They're not one of those big charities where, if you donate a hundred dollars, a dollar of it actually makes it to the veterans. Uh, Ninety-five to a hundred percent of what they take in goes straight back, because this is a charity that's ran by veterans for veterans, and they're they're helping get prosthetic legs. They're getting service dogs, plaques for families of the fallen. Um, I'm all about supporting the Till Valhalla Project because 22 veterans a day lost to suicide is 22 too many. So if you know veterans, first responders, people that are still active duty, anybody that's worn a uniform or served in any capacity, check on them. Make sure they're doing all right because that text from you or that phone call from you or showing up with a six pack of beer might what might be what keeps them off the edge. Uh, because we've all we've all thought those demon fought those demons, and uh, nobody should have to fight those demons alone. Um, yeah, um, you know, damn you, proud. Sometimes to know the guys. darkness tries to close in. You know, right. Yeah, and those 3 a.m. Are you okay, fucker? Text make a world of difference. Yes, they do. Uh, so, you know, anybody you know in your life, friend, family, loved one, uh, just make sure you reach out and check on them. Make sure they're okay because you, know, you never know. The people that seem to be the okayest are often the ones with fight, we are struggling the worst. Uh, and so a lot of times when, when these suicides happen, people are like, I didn't know they were even in a bad place. It's because they bottle it up inside and don't ever share it. So, you know, check on, you know, check on your folks, even the folks you don't think who, you know, need it because you might be surprised that they're the ones that may need it the most. Um, David Weiss says those brain gremlins are sneaky. That is a fact. Yes, they are. Seriously. Um, you know, I keep thinking of that Robin Williams quote and I'm going to paraphrase it very badly, but you know, it's talked about how, you know, the funniest people are usually the ones that are hurting the most. And the reason they're so funny is they felt like shit and they don't want anyone else to feel that way. Exactly. And that is true. That is true. You know, just with you three gentlemen or you two gentlemen, myself, uh, Doc counted as well. You know, we've, we've, we've chased the shadows and sometimes the shadows try to win. And it's really cool when you got a brother to help you fight those shadows. And I can't even imagine what the veterans are going through. I mean, I never had the honor of serving, and God bless you for what you put up with, guys. You know, you guys are awesome. Let me throw the contact information up there. Um, folks, you can contact us at DA Roberts at DA Roberts.net. 
Um, Robbie's got a, got his own contact information as well. Um, he can share with you here in a minute if he, if he wants to, but you know, reach out to, to the show and let us know. I have a challenge for you all. Check your areas, whatever, whatever state you live in, whatever part of the country or part of the world you live in, check your areas and see if there are any inexplicably closed wildlife management areas or campgrounds that are shut down with no explanation that, that are still serviceable that could be used uh, but it were just shut down or if you live in near a, near a lake and you know about ghost towns we'd love to hear about those too so you know definitely check your areas do a little homework do a little research and let us know because i really think we're on to something here i think we may have found may have stumbled into which is much the case what we normally do but we may have stumbled <laughs> onto something critical here uh, so please, if you've got got a few minutes or if you don't mind playing around on the Internet a little bit, which, you know, most of us do, uh, if you, you know, check your area, look for those closed campground areas or closed wildlife management areas. Or if it just happens to be a place you drive by once in a while and realize, hey, this place has been closed for a while. I wonder why we would love to hear about it, uh, because every bit of information we gather is that much more that we can use as researchers and brings us that much closer to bringing, bringing this home. And uh, we really believe, well, we, we know these things are out there and uh, let's, let's, let's show the world that we're not crazy or at least not as crazy as they think we are. Uh, so there, you know, there you go, folks, a little bit of, a little, a little of homework for y'all uh, check out the area, let us know what you find. And you can send us that at DA Roberts at DA Roberts.net. Um, we always, we've been closing out the show here lately, and it's something I'm proud of and something I want to continue doing. Uh, we've been closing out the show with a quote from a song called The Parting Glass. It's an old Irish drinking song, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's sang all over the world in Irish pubs. And sh but shockingly, there are Irish pubs everywhere. You could find them just about on every continent except Antarctica. Um, there's somewhere you, you go, there's an Irish pub. But this song is sang at the end of the night. Uh, but if you listen to the lyrics, it's more than just lifting a glass to the other patrons of the bar as you're heading out the door. It's about saying goodbye to those who aren't there to lift the glass with you anymore. Uh, so I hope you will join with join us in the toast. Doesn't matter what you're drinking, can be water, milk, something something a little stronger, whatever you're drinking, it doesn't matter. Just raise a glass with us to those that we've lost along the way. And the quote I like to end the show with is this: "But since it fell into my lot that I should rise." And you should not. I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.